Welcome everybody. My name is Mina Jane and I am the director of the Ashland Public Library and I'm really thrilled to be bringing you this amazing program about Zero Carbon Home with David Green. I don't know if he's on this side for you as well as for me. <laughs> <laughs> and I will introduce him in just a minute, but I wanted to say a few things prior to getting the program started. Um, first of all, I would like to thank Green Up Ashland and the Ashland Sustainability Committee for helping us bring this program to our community. And I'm really excited to be working with um, these libraries, Dover, Framingham, Holliston, Lexington, Medway, Sherburne, and Tewksbury, who have all banded together to bring David into the, for this program. And um, I always say that when libraries get together, we can do like amazing things. And I think in the next hour or so, you're gonna find that that is absolutely true. I would also like to thank the friends of the Ashland Library who support all of our adult programming. We couldn't do this without them. Actually, they support all of our programming, so we couldn't do any of it without them. Um, so as you know, uh, David Green is here to talk about zero carbon home, how he made his own home zero carbon and how you can make your home zero carbon. He's gonna be doing a presentation in which you can put um, questions about particular topics into the Q&A while he's talking about them and we'll take breaks and um, answer those questions. And then at the end, we'll do a um, like just a free for all <laughs> Q&A. Um, please put your questions in the Q&A. We won't be taking live questions and um, you can put any comments you want, where you're from, um, what you're thinking in the chat and we will be paying attention to that as well. Um, so without further ado, I'm gonna hand it over to David. Uh, thank you, Mina, and uh, welcome everyone. Good evening. Um, I'm going to try now to share my screen and um, and uh, show you show you what we did on our house. Just a moment. All right. Now, if the Zoom gods are with us, you should now be seeing a, a green slide that says. Zero Carbon Home. Mina, do you see that? I do. You're all set. Excellent. Thank you very much. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome. Welcome to this uh, talk this evening. I want to thank all the local public libraries. What a list of towns that uh, Mina read out. And the thing that connects all those towns, apart from like the Charles River watershed and things like that, is a um, a, uh, a belief in, in, in doing green stuff, helping people to cut their carbon footprint. And what I'll show you is how we cut the carbon footprint on our home to zero. And we're saving so much money by not paying for Eversource electricity anymore and not paying for um, heating oil. That's how we used to heat our home, but we don't anymore. Um, uh, we, we're now saving so much money that I'm actually making a very good return on my investment, uh, about 15% return on my investment. And uh, I'm sure everyone right now is terrified about opening up their heating bills, their, their gas bill or their... Um, their heating oil bill. Uh, they've gone through the roof this year, um, thanks to President Putin and uh, disruption of gas supplies in Europe, which is uh, uh, you know, uh, rippled around the world and has, has led to very high increases in both uh, heating oil prices and the natural gas prices. Um, and uh, th th so there's now even a stronger return on investment to be made by cutting out those bills. And because um, and the cost of things like heat pumps and solar panels hasn't gone up, uh, but the cost of the uh, the heating fuel that you're burning has gone up, so the savings have gone up since I did mine over the last few years. Um, David, so I'm going to speak tonight. Um, David, yeah. can I interrupt you for one second? You have a, a password something on your screen that's um, sort of to the right of your um, your ah. presentation. I don't know if you can get rid of that. <laughs> I'll try. I've been trying to get rid of it. It's a Microsoft thing. Uh, I've been trying to get rid of it for years. For, for <laughs> so actually, now. now I can just see the um the. All right. That's good. <laughs> Perfect. Hopefully it'll stay there for the rest of the <laughs> evening. It's one of those things that keeps popping back up annoyingly, but, but anyway, let's, let's try to ignore that. <clears throat> so I'm going to speak this evening, <clears throat> excuse me, mostly about our own experience, cutting our own home's carbon footprint to zero and making, as I said, a 15% return on investment by doing so. And um, for those of you who are financially oriented, and I am, I'll tell you about that in a minute, uh, that's a 15% return on investment. That's after tax. That's also after inflation or indexed for inflation. So it's a very, very good return on investment, much better than, than many venture capital companies earn these days. Um, and there's no volatility. 
Um, so that's a, a very good return on investment. Anyway, so the, so the, the, anyway, you heard me correctly when I when I said that um, you now get paid to cut your carbon footprint. This is a sea change. Ten years ago, it cost a lot of money. Now you make money by cutting your carbon emissions. It will save you money too. So this is disruptive. To use the language of business, it's an inflection point. We're entering a new era, and this is the point of no return. So welcome to the future, everyone. It's a zero carbon future. Um, now, you guys are all going to be muted during the presentation. There'll be four breaks during the presentation, one after heat pumps, one after insulation, one after triple glazed windows, and one after solar panels. And we'll take questions, as Mina said, from the Q&A function, because uh, I don't I don't take too many questions between each section. Otherwise, we'll, we'll be way too late by the time we get to the end of it. But by the time we get to the end, I'll stay on as long as people want me to stay on and answer questions. So if you've got a question tonight about heat pumps or solar panels, I will try to answer that for you um, at the end if we don't get to your question after that section in the presentation. Um, and uh, as Mina probably said already, the webinar is being recorded and you live streamed uh, to, to Facebook while we're doing this. So this is what happened on our house. This is the carbon footprint measured in tons of carbon dioxide up the left-hand scale there. And you can see that the last year is laid out here. It was about 30 to 35 tons of carbon dioxide, which is an enormous amount of carbon dioxide every year. And then we added at the end of 2016, I put solar panels on the roof of my house, which I'll show you a bit later, and heat pumps to replace our air conditioning units. Heat pumps do not, in my opinion, replace furnaces. They replace air conditioning units because most houses in New England are still going to need a backup fossil fuel heating system on days like yesterday, which is so bitterly cold, our heat pumps could not keep up. And so this morning, when I got up, the house was a bit cold, and I turned on our fossil fuel furnace. It's the same one we've had for uh, almost 40 years now, and just turned it on for an hour to get the temperature back up again. I turned it off again, and we're back now on the um, on the heat pumps. But I still use the fossil fuel furnace about 10 days a year on days like yesterday, today, when it's really bitterly cold. Um, so we added solar panels and heat pumps to replace the air conditioning units at the end of 2016. That cut our carbon emissions by almost two thirds. Huge cut from those two combined. Then at the end of 2017, um, uh, I put extra insulation on the roof. I, I paid a contractor to do this. I didn't, didn't do this myself. We have a flat roof, a rubber membrane roof, and um, I paid a contractor to add some insulation to that roof. Uh, and then uh, we added triple glazed windows, which I'll show you, which replaced our ancient, they were original to the house from 1974, and falling apart double glazed windows. Uh, the, the panels have broken and there was a uh, misting up between the, the, the panels. Uh, I'll, I'll show you these later on. Um, so we replaced those with triple glazed windows. Um, and what I found is that the additional cost of triple glazed uh, over the cost of double glazed equivalents pays for itself. Um, the cost of ripping out windows and replacing them does not pay for itself on the fuel bill savings alone. But if you're going to replace them anyway, don't replace them with double glazed, replace them with triple glazed. Or if you have drafty sash windows or uh, just uh, uh, single glazed windows and you and they're in good condition, you don't want to replace them, add window inserts, which I'll come to later on, which is kind of a, an inexpensive way of adding an extra pane of glass to the inside of the window, not to the outside of the window. But, but that's uh, improving the insulation of the building envelope with the uh, insulation and the triple glazed windows that cut our carbon footprint again by about 50%. So from about 10 tons to about five tons. And I thought this was kind of cool. This was much better than I expected. When I set out to do this, I, I thought it'd be a guidebook. I thought I'd just go to my local library in Dover or a Wellesley bookstore or somewhere like that or Amazon and just pick up a guidebook, how to cut your carbon footprint. And there wasn't any. And um, so I started doing this by myself and I was surprised I got to five tons. That's a almost 80% reduction in my carbon footprint, which wasn't sort of what the conventional wisdom was. Um, so when I got that far, I said, well, maybe I can actually push this further. Maybe I can get to zero and that'd be kind of cool. So I added extra solar panels in the middle of 2018 to the roof of my garage. So now I have two solar panel arrays, one on the roof of my house, one on the roof of my garage. <clears throat> Excuse me. And that got us to below zero, actually. So we had a very slightly negative carbon footprint in 2019. Uh, and that continued in 2020 with the pandemic. We had everyone home and it was up a little bit in 2020, and then it was about zero again for 2021, <clears throat> excuse me. So we've cut 35 tons of carbon dioxide, 35 tons. That's equivalent to taking 10 gasoline powered vehicles off the road. One house, 10 cars. This is huge, okay? 
So cutting carbon, cutting carbon emissions also cuts emissions of things like sulfur dioxide, nitric oxides, and particulates, better known as soot, all of which is known as pollution, and all of which cause asthma. Um, so you can improve your family's health, uh, which is a nice short-term benefit, at the same time as saving money, and at the same time as helping to save the planet from global warming. Now, what was even more of a surprise than getting to a zero carbon footprint was the amount of money I'm saving. Um, it's a bit, bit embarrassing to say this, but, but we were spending $11,000 a year on heating and electricity. This was in, uh, say, 2016. Um, and that was about seven or $8,000 on heating oil <clears throat> and uh, about $3,000 a year on electricity as well. But that's all gone. All that expense each year, every year, has gone away. And that earns me about a 15% return on the investment I made. It's about $75,000 was the total of what I spent on heat pumps, insulation, triple glazed windows, and solar panels. Um, and that's a 15% return on investment, 15% after tax, an index for inflation. So I don't know about you, but it's much better than my 401k, uh, which has done nowhere near that well in the last year or so. <clears throat> Excuse me. That was the carbon footprint. Let's talk about the, the bills. Um, I said I used to spend about $11,000 a year on um, heating and electricity combined. And that was cut really following the carbon footprint. It was a reduction in the electricity, so I'm not paying Eversource anymore. And it was a reduction in the heating oil, I'm no longer paying Devony Energy anymore, which is our local oil supplier. Um, and and the, so the uh, energy bills went down as the uh, use of those fossil fuels went down as well. Now that um, that's 35 tons of carbon dioxide gone, okay? That's 35 tons each year, is 35 tons every year, and it's 35 tons forever. Now, it's also $11,000 each year, every year, forever. This is huge. I'm saving tons of money doing this. Now, you may be wondering, okay, David's got a big house. He lives in Dover, Massachusetts. It's a really wealthy town. Um, is this going to work for me? And the answer is yes. And the reason I know that is because I've helped about 20 or so other homeowners um, to cut their carbon footprints and cut their bills as well. And they range from a 1,500 square foot single story house on Long Island to a 14,000 square foot mansion um, in, uh, in Sherburn. Um, so this uh, from, from uh, 1810 New England colonials to new construction. I've worked on all of them and I've never failed to help someone cut their carbon footprint and cut their heating bills, usually significantly. The, the one example of the uh, the small house, the 50, 1,500 square foot house, that's a single man, he's retired, lives alone on a, um, a small income, didn't have a lot of money to, to spend on this, and he focused on insulation and air sealing, uh, did not add solar panels or heat pumps, and he cut his carbon footprint 38%, um, basically doing it himself. He didn't really spend money on contractors or, or equipment to do it, but he cut his carbon footprint 38%, and he's earning a 46% per year return on investment, that's pretty good. Um, so this works on big houses, it works on small houses, it works on new houses, it works on old houses, it works for owner occupiers, also works for tenants. I can tell you a little bit about that later on if there's any, any uh, renters on the, on the call tonight. So this is big, okay? This delivers the triple bottom line, it delivers for the people uh, because we're, we're uh, saving, saving uh, people from asthma, from pollution. It works for the planet because we're uh, reducing the effect of global warming. And it works at a profit too, because you're going to save a ton of money by doing this. Let me show you how we did it. Uh, just, a bit, just a bit about, bit about me. Um, I'm a Brit, if you can't tell by my accent. Came here 30 odd years ago to go to school, went to Harvard Business School. And while I was here, met this girl, fell in love, uh, stayed, uh, married her, and she's uh, now the mother of our children. Uh, who are now themselves off at college. Uh, I got a degree in physics from Oxford University and an MBA from Harvard Business School. So I understand both the, the physics of energy and heat flow in houses and heat loss in houses and the finance side. So I did all my own calculations using Excel spreadsheets to calculate the investment, um, the net present value, the in internal rate of return, et cetera, which is how companies do standard financial analysis. I was CEO of two companies. Actually, this is an old slide. I've actually gone back to one of these companies now. I had retired, um, but now I'm back uh, full-time as the CEO of Biostage, which is a biotechnology company. Um, and in 2014, I was in a nasty road accident. I don't know if you can see here, but there's uh, some scars on my head. You probably can't see them on Zoom. Uh, I was in this very nasty road accident, nearly killed me. And um, 
I was while I was at home bored stiff because the you know the the the, um, the medical advice for a concussion is like turn out the lights, no stimulus, um, no sound, um, and so I just got bored stiff. So I started researching how to cut our family's carbon footprint, uh, which my kids were very keen to do, um, and uh, and uh, being that geeky physicist and that uh, financial analyst in me, I only did things that made both energy sense and made financial sense as well. And that really, I found, cut through a lot of the conventional wisdom in the, in the sort of green building, zero carbon community. Uh, and I found a lot of the things that were conventional wisdom did not make economic sense. They, they certainly cut your carbon emissions and they cut your, um, your carbon footprint, but they didn't make financial sense. And I didn't want to do things that were um, not, not financially sensible. And some of those things, I'll talk about these as we go through it, but there were things like geothermal, uh, makes energy sense, does not make financial sense. Adding insulation to your walls, makes energy sense, does not make financial sense. Um, solar hot water panels, uh, does, again, does not make energy sense. And things like heat recovery ventilators and a super tight building envelope do not make economic sense. They all will cut your carbon footprint, but they don't make sense from an economic point of view. Um, anyways, while I was at home, I, uh, after this road accident, I did the, the research and started doing stuff. And I did the four things I just told you told you about, which I call the Fab Four, heat pumps, insulation, triple glazed windows and solar panels, both the house and I have a swimming pool too. That They both have zero carbon footprints. I'm saving 11 grand a year on the house, 3,000 a year on the pool. I wrote one book about each. That these are the books I had been looking for when I went to the library um, to, to, to take, take a book out on how to cut your carbon footprint. Uh, and I didn't find them. And so, so I wrote the books that I, I wanted to, to have taken out. They're written in plain English. They're easy to understand. I've tried to avoid all kinds of jargon. Um, I think I do mention BTUs once, but uh, I think I'll probably get away with it. Um, and, uh, and I don't work for any, any manufacturer or installer or town. Um, uh, so I'm, I'm completely free of those usual conflicts of interest. I do sell a book, the books I've, I've written on this, but everyone here is gonna get it for free. Um, I'll give you a code at the end. You just go to my website, download the book, and uh, enter the code and you'll get it for free. Um, and I do consult the homeowners, but I don't really do it anymore because, um, because I'm back full time in, in biotech. And my advice this evening is based on my experience, but neither me nor the company that I consult through is giving investment tax, legal or financial advice, or providing any kind of guaranteed results. Now, I'm not going to tell you tonight that you need to eat vegetarian. Turn down your thermostat. Wear a cardigan like uh, like Jimmy Carter did. Bike to work, have fewer children, or vote for Al Gore. In fact, I don't care who you vote for. I don't care whether, whether you believe climate change is a Chinese hoax or you think it's an existential threat to humanity. I'm just going to talk about how to save money. How to save money by cutting your carbon footprint. I think we can all agree on saving money. And in fact, I'm not going to, going to really tell you to do anything tonight. I'm just going to show you what we did that made sense. Um, and it is complete coincidence or perhaps destiny, if you believe in that kind of stuff. Our family name really is green. I'm not making it up. I got it from my father. Um, and I'm not making up anything else in this presentation either. So how did I gather all this data? You'll see this is a very data-filled presentation this evening. Uh, um, it started with our house. Now, since then, I've done it on about 20 other houses. And uh, so I've used all that data together to inform uh, what I'm telling you about tonight. But it started with our house, which is a two-story, 5,400 square foot houses, about you know, quite a bit bigger than normal, built in 1974, four inch cavity walls, two by four uh, frame construction, filled with fiberglass. And before we went zero, it had no energy efficiency features whatsoever. In fact, it's a pretty energy inefficient house because we have a lot of glass. And most of the windows on the ground floor are actually sliding glass patio doors. I'm gonna live in Dover, <clears throat> and Dover has 5,800 heating degree days. Heating degree days are a measure of how cold it gets in the wintertime. Um, and that's the same all across New England. So pretty much everyone on this call um, will be in the same uh, climate zone. But I, but I do get people from all over the world um, on, on these webinars because we do them on Zoom. Um, and uh, so you, you do need to be aware of how many heat and degree days you get. Uh, but that basically is true for all of the, all of the northern United States, uh, anything north of like the Mason-Dixon line. And uh, every day for two years, I measured the heating oil use and the electricity used by our home. This is the kind of super geek I really am. I kept it all in a spreadsheet and I used this data to build an energy model of how our home was using energy. And uh, for those of you who have a statistics background, the R squared of that model is 80%. Um, that's a statistical measure that measures how, how predictive your model is. 100% means perfect, 0% means hopeless. 80% um, is very good for a model of this, of this nature. And this predicted our full year bills 
to within about 10%. That was GN1 on the model, and now on about GN5. Um, and the current version is about accurate, about 5%. And I use that energy model to translate things into cash flow, which is a standard way that every investment analyst, every economist, every business person uh, measures the return on investment. Uh, it's a very standard mathematical calculation, and that allows you to measure things like net present value, which is how much really the total profit you make on investment, the IRR or return on investment, like 5% or 10% per year, and then the payback period, how many years it takes to get back the amount you invested from the savings on the heating bill or the electricity bill. And I measured the cut in energy and the cut in, in money for each one of the fab four, that would be heat pumps, insulation, triple glazed windows and solar panels, and I've done almost the same thing for about 20 different clients now. And so what I could do is I could tell which changes made energy sense, cut the, cut the uh, uh, carbon emissions, and which ones made financial sense. And what I found was many things that are quite popular in the green building community, things like geothermal, solar hot water panels, making a super tight building envelope, which means blocking all the drafts, and adding insulation to your walls made energy sense, but did not make financial sense. And I ended up only doing four things. Um, which, uh, which were heat pumps, insulation, triple glazed windows, and solar panels. And you may be asking yourselves, well, why is this true now? Why, why, why couldn't I have done this in the past? And it's really because the technology has got much, much better in just the last few years. Uh, insulation has got better, heat pumps have got better, solar panels have got much better, and triple glazed windows have got much better than the old fashioned ones. Um, and so they're all so good now. And in addition to subsidies from government, federal and state governments, and your utility companies, are so significant you can, by following these instructions or these examples, cut the carbon emissions from your home to zero, save thousands of dollars a year on heating and electricity bills, and make a good return on your investment. Um, how do we do it? Well, I mentioned the Fab Four, heat pumps, insulation, triple glazed windows and solar panels. It's easy to remember this because the real Fab Four, that would be the Beatles, I'm a Brit, I'm sure it shows, had lots of hits, HOTS, heat pumps, insulation, triple glazed windows and solar panels. How did we go zero and make money? We installed the Fab Four and we got all the tax breaks and subsidies. So let's do this one by one. And when I get to the end of this section, I'll take a couple of questions from Mina in the, uh, the Q&A function uh, on heat pumps. Um, and then we'll do the other, the other four, the other three. And then when we get to the end, we'll just take questions on any topic you like. So these are the results of our heat pumps. Um, they were the, the biggest single um, uh, cause of cutting our carbon footprint. They cut it almost in half by about 20 tons per year, saving us about $3,000 a year. The total investment, including, including installation, was about $26,000. Paid for itself, about, will pay for itself in about nine years. I'm in about year five or six now. Um, and the return on investment is about 9%, that's after tax. Um, now, that's the savings just from the heating bill and the electricity bill. Sorry, the heating bill goes down, the electricity bill goes up. It's the net of those two. Um, now, in addition to that, there's an article published in Nature Energy, which is a major academic medical uh, academic um, journal, um, where uh, the researchers reported there was about a four to seven percent price increase for houses that have heat pumps compared to similar houses without them. Now, on an average house, this translates to a premium of about ten to seventeen thousand dollars, or roughly what heat pumps would cost on an average house. So this means you no longer have to wait for the payback period, or nine years in this case, to get your money back on heat pumps. You get it back as soon as you sell your house. This is a bit of a bit of a, a, a sea change from uh, from the past, where some people would see these numbers and say, "Well, a nine percent return. I I don't really understand that, but I do understand nine years. I'm not going to be in my house for nine years, so I'm not going to do it." Well, now if you're not going to be in your house because you're going to sell your house, it does make sense to add um, heat pumps. You'll also see the same kind of thing for adding solar panels. Solar panels increase the price of your house. And so actually adding heat pumps and adding solar panels actually makes your house more attractive to sell. It increases the sales price compared to not adding them. Now, the, um, the, uh, uh, the, air, the, the, the heat pumps I'm talking about here are air-sourced heat pumps, not geothermal. Geothermal is sometimes called ground-sourced heat pumps, and the technology is very, very similar, but a ground-sourced heat pump takes the heat from the ground, an air-sourced heat pump takes the heat from the air. We had a quote for geothermal on our house, it was $98,000. That's four times the cost of air source heat pumps. Geothermal is one of those things that makes energy sense. It will cut your, cut your, um, your energy use and cut your carbon emissions, but did not make financial sense. Now these are our heat pumps, we've got two units. We've got an upstairs and a, ground, and a downstairs, one for each zone. Uh, and these replaced our old 1970s era air conditioning units. 
um, and they both heat the house and cool the house. Um, they cool the house just the same as an air conditioner and they're the same efficiency as an air conditioner, but when they heat the house, they heat with two and a half times the efficiency of a furnace or a boiler. This is the huge gain from using heat pumps. It's that gain in efficiency compared to a fossil fuel furnace or boiler. The, the cooling is the same efficiency as an air conditioning unit. So if you're looking at these and thinking they look just like air conditioning units, well, you're exactly right, they do. And they replaced our AC units. And this is one place where my advice to people is often different to uh, other people. Other people often say heat pumps should replace furnaces. I believe that's not really good for most people in New England. And most people in New England will want to replace their AC unit with a heat pump because it will cool the same way your AC unit does today, but it will also heat in the winter time with that two and a half times efficiency um, and, uh, and, and keep your fossil fuel furnace gas or, or heating oil or propane because very few houses will be able to uh, heat all winter long, like on days like today and yesterday when it's bitterly cold out um, with, with only heat pumps. If you're building a new house, you can heat only with heat pumps, but you need super insulation and you need great windows and a really tight building envelope, which means no drafts. Um, but you, so you can do it on a new house. It's very, very difficult to do this on an existing house. So I always recommend people to leave their, their fossil fuel furnace in place. Um, your, your heating fuel usage will go down dramatically, um, but you'll probably still need it on a few days a year when it's too cold for the heat pumps to, uh, to, to do it on their own. So let me just explain a bit about how heat pump works. Uh, most people think they're not familiar with heat pumps, but it's not true. Everyone is because your refrigerator is a heat pump. What it does is it moves the heat from one place to another. It moves the heat or removes the heat, if you like, from inside the fridge and dumps it out the back. It makes the inside colder. It makes the back of the fridge warmer. So if you put your hand down the back of the fridge where that long row of, of thin black metal pipes is, um, it's warm. That's the warmth that was inside your milk that's been moved to the back of the fridge and is now warming up your kitchen air. And if I, in fact, I can remember when I was a kid, my mum used, used to start trays of seedlings uh, for the garden on top of the refrigerator because it was warmer there and that would make the seedlings uh, germinate quicker. Now, a heat pump on a bigger scale, the scale of your house, is what we call an AC unit. It's the same thing as in your fridge. It's moving heat from one place to another, but instead of moving it from the milk to the outside of the kitchen, it's moving it from the inside of the house to the outside of the house, uh, cooling down the inside of the house and heating up the, the outside air. So if you stand outside uh, in the summertime and put your hand over your air conditioning unit, it's, it's very hot. It might be 110 degrees or 120 degrees over the, um, over the, uh, uh, the uh, outdoor unit for the, for the air conditioning unit. That's the heat that was in your house. It's been moved out to the outside, making the inside colder and the outside warmer. Now imagine reversing that in the winter time, and now the heat pump is pumping heat into your house, making your house warmer, but it must cool down the outside. And this is where it gets a little bit counterintuitive because it's already cold outside, it's winter time, you need the heat in the house. So how can, it, how can the heat pump take heat from cold air and bring it inside. Well, a physicist like me will tell you, um, as long as the, the air is above uh, absolute zero, there's heat in it, and you can, you can take that heat and move it inside, but you must then cool down the outside air. And let me show you how this happens. So this is me measuring the temperature of my heat pumps in the wintertime. On the left here, I'm using an infrared thermometer. I'm just measuring the temperature on the inlet side, the air inlet side, of the heat pump, you can see it's 4.7 degrees Fahrenheit. It's a very cold winter day. You can see the snow on the ground. I'm wearing ski gloves. On the right-hand side, you can see me measuring over the top or the outlet side of the heat pump, and it's minus 19.6 degrees Fahrenheit. Unbelievably cold. Why is it so cold? Because the heat's been taken out of it and pushed into my house, warming my house up. In fact, if it's so cold, if you put your hand over that heat pump, you get frostbite um, as well, unless you're wearing ski gloves. Um, so that's how heat pumps work. They make one place colder, one place warmer, just like your fridge, but it's reversed in wintertime to make the outside air colder still, and that heat is taken and pushed into the house. And that is why they are so efficient, because moving heat from one place to another is far more efficient than creating heat by burning something like natural gas or heating oil. Now, what you just saw is a ducted system. We have duct work at our house to move the warm air around and to move the cool air around in the summertime. If you don't have duct work, um, and we, this is our, our rental house. We have a second house in Dover that we rent out. 
Um, and this has, uh, so the, 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 the first one, a uh, house which I'm sitting in right now doing this webinar, uh, made by Bosch. Those are a ducted heat pump system uh, using the ductwork. This is a ductless system at our rental house. The rental house did not have air conditioning, did not have um, uh, ductwork at all. So when we installed the heat pumps there, we used these ductless mini split units um, that had these outdoor units made by Mitsubishi. And then the indoor unit, I paid a bit extra to have these ceiling mounted units because I just think they look nicer than the, the wall mounted units you, you usually see um, with uh, heat pumps. Um, in, in, in the mini split uh, variety. So, um, so these things that they work very well, either the ducted system like at our, our main house or the ductless system at our, at our rental property, they both work very well. Um, so, uh, so for details on, um, on how we did all this at a much greater level of detail than I've just gone through, uh, you can see it all in chapter two in the book, uh, which you get for free with the code at the end of the, end of the webinar. I don't recommend geothermal as I mentioned, it does work. Uh, but it's not cost effective. Um, air source heat pumps like the air conditioning units I just showed you, they work with radiators and four stop water systems as well as with um, uh, ductwork, a four stop air system like we have in our house. Uh, they also work for swimming pools. I have a swimming pool, um, I have my, my swimming pool heater it used to be propane, it's now a heat pump and they work for hot water tanks as well. I have a heat pump hot water tank in the basement. It's very cheap to run, especially when running off solar panels. And as I, as I mentioned, leave your furnace in place. Heat pumps, at least in New England, replace AC units. They do not replace furnaces. At least that's my opinion. There are other people who will tell you differently. They'll say, no, 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 you can replace your furnace with a heat pump. Um, I, I think that's really only possible on new construction. I don't think that's possible. I've, I've never seen it done successfully. In fact, I've had people on webinars like this who've said, um, I, I have to keep my house at 65 degrees in the winter to avoid going bankrupt because their heating bills are so high if they don't have um, solar panels to generate cheap electricity for them. I also recommend getting multiple quotes. Let's just pause here and take a couple of questions. I mean, if you wanna just uh, ask me a couple of questions from the, from the chat. Sure, we have a bunch. And I wanna remind people that they, um, that we'll be taking questions at the end. So if we don't get it to now, we will get to it. Um, let's see, Diane asks, Heat pumps often transmit cool air before the heat comes up, and that is quite uncomfortable in the winter. Is that avoidable? Um, so in my experience with moving from a fossil fuel heating system to a heat pump system, I would say it's no different. Um, uh, a, a furnace takes time to heat up, and when you turn it on, it's not instantly warm. Um, well, certainly it isn't if you've got an old fashioned dinosaur heating oil furnace like I have. If you have a modern natural gas furnace, it may come on much quicker, but there's always gonna be a pause as the duct work and the heating coils warm up. So there's always gonna be some uh, air blowing around the house that's cool once the system comes on. Um, I don't think it's any worse um, with our heat pumps than it was uh, before. Um, so if, 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 it, if there is an effect there, and that there may be a small effect there, it's not big enough for me, me to notice or, or be concerned about it. Um, one thing I do find with heat pumps is they are better at maintaining the temperature at a steady uh, temperature rather than, than coming up and down quickly. So when, for instance, when I get up in the morning, um, I, I set the thermostat to come on a couple of hours before I get up for breakfast, uh, because it takes a couple of hours to warm up the house to the full temperature, whereas a fossil fuel furnace will definitely get there quicker. So you may have, might have to turn it on maybe just an hour before you get up if you've got natural gas or heating oil, but I, I do it for about two hours before I get up um, to make sure the house is at the, the set point temperature, which is 70 degrees in our house um, by the time I get up for breakfast. Uh, does that answer your question, Diane? I, mean, I hope so. <laughs> okay, all right. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'll ask, ask at the end, okay? Okay. Um, so a couple of people have asked this, um, De Deborah and Robert. Um, is it worthwhile to get a heat pump, even though you have to, even though you said that you have to keep a gas furnace um, and they rarely use the AC in the summer? And Robert says that your book says the heat pump, will, but you have to keep the furnace. Is that expensive to keep two, particularly when the oil furnace may need replacing? Is there a dual, is that a dual source heat pump? Is there a dual source heat pump? Um, I've never heard of one. I think I assume what you mean by dual source is something that can use a fossil fuel as well as use the heat pump. Mm -hmm. I've never seen something like that. They're really two very separate 
systems. One is to move the heat around, around that refrigeration loop circuit. Uh, and the other one is to burn a fossil fuel um, and then um, and then uh, you know, exhaust the, the, the soot and the gases and things like that. So I just don't think it would be, be technically possible to incorporate the two, but they are incorporated into the air handler unit. So although the source of the heat can be different. The source of the heat in, in my my system down in my basement, there's two sources of heat. There's the fossil fuel furnace, which which circulates water between the, the boiler and the uh, air handler unit. So it puts warm water through a copper coil that deposits the heat into the flowing air. Um, and that is set next to, actually in, in line with the um, heat exchanger coils from the heat pumps, which also dump their heat into the same air flow. So either one can be on and the air will be warm. And the thermostats take care of both of them. So the thermostats just when you have, when you get a heat pump, it will come with new thermostats, and the thermostats will now control both your fossil fuel furnace and your heat pumps. And they know the software is there to say, okay, we'll switch over from the heat pumps um, to the fossil fuel furnace when the heat pumps can no longer keep up. And for instance, this happens on on days like yesterday when it was really cold. Um, so our our fossil fuel furnace has been on um, uh, probably for several hours. Um, this morning uh, to get the, the, the temperature up because the heat pumps were not able to keep it up there on their own. Um, so I think, I, think, I, I think if you're going to uh, put in a, a new heat pump, you think of, it, think of it as replacing the air conditioning unit. And if, if you're able to use that heat pump to, um, to heat your house all winter long, well, then take out your fossil fuel furnace. But I wouldn't take it out right away. I certainly wouldn't take it out just because the... Uh, the HVAC guy, the contractor says you can, I would wait a couple of years to make sure that you don't need some extra top up heat from the fossil fuel furnace before we take it out. And in my case, uh, we can't do it. Uh, so I plan to keep my fossil fuel furnace, otherwise I'd be divorced by now because we'd have a house at 60 degrees in the morning. Um, so rather than do that, uh, we just kept the old one. That didn't cost me anything because we had it already. It came with a house. Um, so it didn't cost me anything to replace it. Um, uh, so we just have, we have two heating systems now. We have a heat pump heating system and a fossil fuel heating system. They work in parallel with each other and they're integrated through the, through the new thermostats that control both systems together. Um, so Robert just had a follow-up that there are dual source heat pumps and they're usually natural gas. And Alan in the chat said that some people can rely just on one or more mini split heat pumps. They do and they're truly fossil free. Um, yeah. It's, okay. it's definitely doable. I'm, I'm not saying it's not doable. It's definitely doable. Uh, but in my experience, uh, you, you tend to have to need really good insulation, really good windows um, in order to, to, uh, to, to heat entirely on your heat pump system. You can definitely do it, uh, but you need a, a very well-designed system. And you need a very, uh, a very tight thermal envelope, meaning you've got good insulation and good draft sealing uh, to get there. So, so it can be done. Um, and I definitely know people who've done it, uh, but for most people who are retrofitting an existing house, uh, and a lot of houses tend to be quite leaky um, and poorly insulated, uh, I, I would say at least keep your fossil fuel furnace until you've proven to yourself that for a couple of winters, you can get through that winter without needing the fossil fuel furnace. Okay. Um, just a couple of people wanted to know how much it costs. Uh, um, let's see your ductless mini split heat pump? Um, so so uh, the short answer was, was about 50,000 for the uh, mini split system. It was much more expensive, almost twice the price of the ducted system. And that's because for ductless systems, you need to have more indoor units. So there's just more machinery you need to buy. For the ducted system, we have two heat pumps, one for the upstairs, uh, floor, one for the downstairs floor um, at, at our house where I am right now. Uh, and the, the, air, the air handler units, just the blower fan units, they circulate the air around either the upstairs or the downstairs. So there's only four pieces of machinery. There's two outdoor units, there's two indoor units. But our, at our rental house, which is smaller, it's only 3,400 square feet, there are three outdoor units and there are, I think, eight indoor units. Um, so mini splits tend to be more economical if you've got an open plan floor plan, so you get good air circulation around the house. But if you've got a, um, a more traditional floor plan with a lot of rooms, um, you're going to need some heating in each room. And so you need a lot more heads to, um, to, to get the heat in every room. Now, our house, where we put this, um, 
mini split system in was unusual in that it had uh, it was almost impossible to actually fit ductwork to that house. We had to go with ductless mini split. There's no attic in that house, and there's very little basement. Um, whereas if you do have a basement and you do have an attic, there's a kind of a cheaper way to do mini splits, which is to do a, a mini split unit for the basement um, that does some ductwork. So, so the only expense is coming through the basement to the, to the ground floor and in the attic, and then going through uh, registers in, the, in the, uh, the upper walls. So you don't need to put ductwork through the walls of the house to get up to the second floor. That's what's really expensive on a, on a retrofit to an existing house. But you can, you can do it quite cheaply if you've got a basement space and you've got an attic space uh, by putting limited ductwork in under the floor, on the ground floor, and over the ceiling in the, in the, in the attic. And that will get you a pretty good air distribution um, uh, without having to go through all the expense of having heads on those uh, mini split units in every room. Okay. Um, we do have a few more questions, but like we, uh, we'll get to them later if you want to keep moving on. Yeah, okay, great. Um, so, uh, so this slide is, um, it's, I'm not gonna read through this, it's too complicated, but if you are thinking about getting heat pumps, please download this slide from my website. This is all available for free. You can just download all the slides I've used tonight, but please download this one because these are the questions you need to be asking a heat pump installer, uh, which I, I won't go through tonight. It's just, just too, um, too complicated. Um, so let's move on to the next one, insulation. So insulation was the, um, uh, uh, had a, a, a sizable impact on our, our, um, our carbon footprint, about seven tons, 16% cut, saving us $3,000 a year. This is more than we saved with the heat pumps, but the investment was only $1,000, not $20,000 like the heat pumps. So this pays for itself within the first winter. The return on investment was over 100%, and again, that's after tax. Um, this is the best uh, return on investment I've ever made, uh, far better than my, my 401k, uh, and you will do far more to save the planet from global warming by insulating the ceiling of your basement than by buying an electric vehicle. This saved us seven tons of uh, carbon dioxide, and most of this from insulating the ceiling of the basement. There was, there was already insulation on our roof. Uh, we have a flat roof member. There was already some insulation. I added more, but the place that was uninsulated was the ceiling of the, the basement. This had a huge effect. Um, and so just, and that was very simple. I, just, I, I bought the fiberglass myself and just installed this, pushing it up in, in between the rafters um, in, the, uh, in, the, in the basement. Saved us um, uh, almost $3,000 a year for an investment of about $1,000 on a weekend of my time uh, installing the, the installation. And that saves seven tons of carbon dioxide. If you go from a, 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 a gasoline driven car to a, a, an electric vehicle, that will save about two tons of carbon dioxide per year. Seven tons from insulating the ceiling of my basement, two tons from switching from a gasoline car to an electric vehicle. Except the EV will cost you about $50,000, whereas the uh, insulation cost me $1,000. So this is a no brainer in terms of uh, cutting your carbon footprint and saving yourself money. So this is what we did on the, on the roof here, you can see on the left, we added 10 inches of fiberglass, that's the pink Owens Corning stuff, you can see in the middle of the picture there. Plus we added four inches of ISO board. ISO board is like spray foam in a board, so it's very easy to just screw down to the roof. Um, and we did two layers of that. Each one is about um, R10. Insulation is measured in R values and, and more is better. So th that uh, 10 inches of fiberglass is about R30. The two, the, the two uh, ISO boards about R10 each. So that's about R50, which is a very well insulated roof. Um, in the ceiling of the basement, you can see what I did there. That uh, brown stuff is the fiberglass. It's, the reason it's brown is made from a recycled glass and hence a little bit more environmentally friendly than the, the pink Owens Corning stuff. Um, and I just put 12 inches of that, bought it from a local store and just push fit it up in between the rafters there. This had a huge impact on, um, on our bills and our carbon footprint. Now, if you're this is our basement is just used as storage space. Um, if you're using your basement as living space, then you do not want to insulate the ceiling. Instead, you want to insulate the walls and maybe the floor with a carpet and a nice um, uh, underlay pad as well to give, give some insulation. Um, but if you're using it as living space, you do not want to insulate the, the house from the, from the living space on, in the basement. But if you're not using it as living space, if you're using it as storage, then the best thing you can do is insulate that, um, that ceiling and keep the heat up in the house. And what will happen is your basement will get cooler. Our basement got about eight degrees Fahrenheit cooler um, after installing this insulation on the ceiling of the basement. 
Now, if you're doing insulation, you, you may as well do air sealing at the same time. Air sealing is very simply filling up the gaps in the house where the drafts come in. And um, I did this in the basement of my house. Um, I just bought a few cans of spray foam from the local um, uh, Home Depot. And it, this is quite fun you just go around spraying things with spray foam um, to, to block, block uh, drafts um, from, from the basement, which is where most of the drafts in the house come in. They come in through the, through the basement. Um, academic studies have shown that insulation and air sealing is very, very cost effective, very effective, um, but it is not necessary to get to a super tight building envelope. Um, you may have heard of something called passive house, which is a German standard for very low energy um, houses, and they, they have an air infiltration standard or drafts standard of 0 0.6 ACH50, which stands for air changes per hour at 50 pascals, which is a, a unit of pressure like pounds per square inch. Um, and, and, but it's not necessary. My house is 4.6 ACH50. I measured this using a blower door test. That is way more than the passive house level, um, but I have a zero carbon footprint. I also have zero bills. The, um, the problem in my opinion with the passive house movement is it's, it's great on energy efficiency and it has no financial measurements whatsoever. So they recommend a lot of things that are very expensive to do and do not make economic sense, like getting to a super tight building envelope when in fact it's much cheaper to cut your carbon footprint elsewhere. Um, now in, in Massachusetts where most people are um, uh, this evening, um, you can get a lot of this paid for by the government, by MassSave. Um, uh, MassSave will pay 75% of the cost of insulation up to $2,000 and they'll pay 100% of the cost of draft sealing. They will not pay for spray foam, they only pay for uh, fiberglass or blown in cellulose. But this is the lowest hanging ripest fruit in the garden. This is a a picture of my peaches in the summertime, I, I grow some uh, peach trees and you can see the branches are so heavy, they're weighing down to the ground there. This is the lowest hanging and ripest fruit in the garden. So please pick it by the bushel. So if you spend 500 bucks on insulation, you'll get $2,000 worth of insulation through MassSave. And uh, that will probably save you a thousand bucks a year. So this is, this is the best investment you can ever make. Um, and you'll get the, the state to pay for most of it. Now, now, this is really being paid for on your electricity bill there's a surcharge on your electricity bill that pays for this mass save program. So if you're not taking advantage of it, you're just paying for other people to insulate their houses. Um, so for details on, on what we did, what types of insulation we used where, and there are many different types of insulation, uh, please see chapter one in Zero Carbon Home, you'll all get it for, for free. Uh, I don't recommend taking off the siding, thickening your walls with insulation, replacing it. Um, this will cut your carbon footprint, but it's very expensive. We had a quote in our house to take off the siding boards, add a two inch ISO board and refit it, $150,000. No way that ever would have been paid for by the savings on the heating bill. Um, so it, although it does work, uh, it's just way too expensive. So you're much better off insulating your attic and um, the ceiling of your basement or the walls of your basement if you're using it as living space rather than thinking about thickening your walls. You don't need to get to this super tight building envelope. Um, mine is far worse than, than that. So let's just pause here, uh, Mina, and take a couple more questions on insulation or air sealing. Yep. Um, Beverly says, fiberglass on basement ceiling as opposed to spray foam? Um, so, so yes, is the answer. So firstly, that's what I did, and it's definitely what I recommend. Uh, basement ceilings tend to have a lot of stuff going on. You've got wires running here and there. You've got pipes running here and there. If you spray foam at all, you'll never be able to get to it. So you really don't want to be using spray foam in the, in the ceiling of a basement. You really want to be using fiberglass. You can easily just pull it out if you need to get something or you need to put a new pipe in or um, run a new uh, conduit or something or, or, or um, run some Wi-Fi cables or something. Um, so uh, yeah, I definitely don't, don't recommend using spray foam in the, in the ceiling of the basement. Spray foam is great in attics, uh, where it acts as an air barrier to air seal the attic, as well as an insulation barrier. Uh, although I have to say I've never used it um, because um, my objection to spray foam is that it burns and it burns with a thick black toxic smoke. And no one ever talks about this, but it's true. Um, whereas there are other products you can use like fiberglass. Fiberglass is dirt cheap. It's really safe. Uh, I mean, uh, you have to wear a face mask, like a COVID face mask, when you're installing it because the fibers do irritate. But once it's up there, it works perfectly fine. Um, you know, it's dirt cheap, lasts forever. You can store it yourself if you want to. If you want to go a little bit more sophisticated, you can use something like Roxol, a rock wool board, which is also inflammable. It cannot burn. It's literally rock. Uh, fiberglass is literally glass. It cannot burn. Um, 
or even things like dense packed cellulose, which is basically recycled newspaper, but it's treated with a flame retardant so it doesn't burn. Uh, but spray foam, I, I just can't get over the fact that it burns with a thick black toxic smoke. So I, I, I've never actually used it. I know a lot of people will disagree on me with me on this. They'll say spray foam is magic. It seals the, the gaps. It's, um, it's, it's cheap and it, uh, it uh, insulates as well and is all those things. But I just can't get over the fact that it burns. Mm. Um, Rose asks, does super tight building envelope lead to indoor air quality problems such as an accumulation of toxic gases, odors, or radon? Um, it can do, okay? And this is another reason why I'm not particularly keen on super tight building envelopes. Firstly, you don't need it in order to get to a zero carbon footprint and zero bills. I've proven that uh, on my own house. But I also think there are dangers in getting there. The biggest one I've come across is actually mold. It's not, it's not the toxic gases. Uh, but if you've got radon, clearly you're going to be trapping that radon in the house. That's not a good idea. If you've got radon, you really need a vent in your basement to get it out without it filtering up into the house. But um, uh, but uh, yeah, I think it's it's just um, you you can get stuffiness in a house, and and you can get condensation um, in the walls of a house that will not evaporate uh, if it's behind a spray foam barrier, and and that can lead to um, to mold and to asthma. And I'm not making this up. Um, the, the lady who, who currently rents our, our rental house uh, rented it because her other house, which she moved out of, was condemned by the Board of Health. It was literally knocked down uh, by the Board of Health because she had been going to the emergency room with asthma because of mold inside the house. So this is not a theoretical thing. I think you can get too tight of a building envelope and um, it's, to me, it's just way too expensive to get there. And it does also pose these additional risks, whether it's mold or whether it's um, stuffiness or trapping radon. So I, I'm just not a big fan of a super tight building envelope for, for any of the above reasons. Wade asks, does cutting infiltration cause excess humidity? Uh, does cutting infiltration, so it can do, it can do. And that's uh, uh, one of my cautions when I was talking about mold uh, in, in answering the last question, is the humidity that is trapped that causes the mold. Um, so there is some air coming through your walls. It's impossible to keep them completely airtight. And most walls in New England are actually fairly drafty. Um, and that's bad because it's cooling your house down in the winter time. But it's also uh, evaporating moisture trapped in your walls. And there's always going to be moisture trapped in your walls. If you go out in the morning and there's dew on the grass, there's dew in your walls. It's the laws of physics. You can't get away from it. And that water in the walls will evaporate as the sun comes up or as air moves up and down the wall cavity. Even with insulation, air is moving up and down, at least with spray foam insulation. Sorry, uh, with fiberglass insulation, air is still moving through that uh, fiberglass, whereas with spray foam, it is not. So, um, so yeah, I, I think having some air, air infiltration in houses is actually a good thing. Um, and it, it can be... Um, dangerous is going a bit far, but it can be unhealthy to, to get to a really super tight building envelope. And it's really expensive to do so because you need to hire experts to do it. This is not something that the average Joe is going to be able to do. Mm -hmm. um, and Elaine asks, she, she said she was told MathSave doesn't discount insulation if they find even a half an inch already in the walls. Is that true? And are you saying paying for wall insulation is not cost effective? Um, so uh, that's not been my experience, but I also, but my experience has also been that MassSave is a very variable program. It really depends on which contract you get, and even sort of, you know, what 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 kind of a day they've had. So it can be very variable. But um, I have seen MassSave um, do walls. They put in put blown in cellulose into um, uh, one of my clients' walls. Um, they did it uh, not quite for free, but at a heavily discounted rate. Um, and it, it transformed her house. Her house was very drafty, very cold, lots of cold spots in the corners on the outside walls, and also quite noisy. It was on a, uh, a Route 109, which is a fairly good sized um, road here. Um, and it really quietened down her house, uh, reduced her bills, uh, reduced her carbon footprint, and made her house just much more comfortable to live in because there's so, so fewer cold spots um, in, in the walls. So, so, so Massey will definitely do it. And if, if they will do it for you um, and do, uh, say, blown-in cellulose, that's the only thing I think they'll, they'll really do on walls, uh, I, I would get it done. 
but sometimes you have to point the contractors towards it. Uh, massive contractors get paid to do stuff. So what they tend to like to do is the quick, cheap, easy stuff. So they'll come in and blow in, uh, blown in cellulose into your attic and, and be gone and take their money and go. But if you point them to the ceiling of your basement and you point them to the walls, you can get them to do it. But, but sometimes they just will come in, get done, you check the boxes and leave. Um, and, but if you, if, you, if you kind of be nice to them and, and, uh, and point out the places in your house where you think it needs installation, you can often persuade them to do it. Okay, um, if you don't mind, I'm gonna ask one more question about yeah. this. Okay. Um, let's see, <laughs> of course I have to find it again. Um, to do, sorry, go ahead, go on to the next thing, I'll ask. Okay, well, you can, uh, you can always uh, pick it up later on if you want. Yep. Uh, so let's go to the third part of, of um, HITS or the Fab Four, which is triple glazed windows. Um, so these cut our carbon footprint the least of all of the Fab Four, about two tons or 5%. Uh, now this is the incremental or the additional cut in carbon footprint for triple glazed windows compared to double glazed. Because remember our windows were falling apart. And so our decision was, do we, we have to replace them, but do we replace them with double glazed or do we replace them with triple glazed? And so for us, uh, the incremental cost was about $1,000, um, uh, not very much at all, because most of the cost of the windows is in the installation of the windows and in buying the frame, not buying that extra panel of glass to go in, into it. Um, uh, and the investment was only about $4,500 to, uh, to go for triple glazed over double glazed, paid for itself in under five years, with about a 19% return on investment. Um, now, if your windows are in perfectly good shape and you're not facing the same decision that we had of we had to replace them anyway, um, then, the, uh, the, 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 then you're not going to save enough money on the heating bill to replace all of your windows. It's just way too expensive to, to do that. Unless you do something like the window inserts, which are fit from the inside, triple glazed windows, which I'll show you in just a minute. So these are our old windows. You can see the, the panel on the left is missed it up. We couldn't even see the garden. Uh, 1970s vintage, uh, metal framed windows, uh, and you can see on the right hand side that the house has shifted a little bit and the, the, there's a one inch gap between the window and the frame, which I'd sealed over with duct tape here. So these are pretty, pretty bad windows, which we replaced. And we replaced them with these, these uh, very nice wood framed triple glazed windows. Um, and so um, remember, we are talking about our houses here. We're not just talking about, you know, the bills and, and the carbon footprint. These are the places we live and we like them to be nice and, and to look good and to, and to feel good to, to live in. And I hope you agree here, my living room is much better now than it was before. You, we can see the garden out of the windows and the wood frame really adds to the, the, the look and feel of the house, I think. Um, and, we, and, and because of these triple glazed windows in the, dine, in the living room um, and the installation on the, on the ceiling of the basement, we can now use the living room at Christmas. Before we did this, it was really hard. If we had a cold Christmas, it was unpleasant to be in the living room at Christmas time because we had single glazed windows. Some of these windows are single glazed, some were double glazed. Um, and we replaced them all with triple glazed and insulated the ceiling of the basement. And now the living room uh, can be kept warm even when the outside temperature is very low. Um, and so it's made our, our Christmas, uh, Christmas in the living room is now pleasant, whereas before it was really um, unpleasant to be in the, in the living room uh, if it was cold out. Um, so let me just explain how a triple glazed window works. There are three panels of glass in the middle there, uh, the outside of the windows on the left, the inside of the, of the windows on the right. The outside one has um, a, a coating on it, a very, very thin metal coating. You can't see it, um, but it reflects the ultraviolet light. The ultraviolet light is the, is the type of light in the sun that gives you a suntan. Um, and it's the type of light that uh, fades your carpets and fades your photographs and things. So you really want to keep it out of the house. So that thin coating reflects away the ultraviolet light while allowing the visible light to come through and uh, keep your, your house nice and light. On the inside, you have the opposite. You want to keep the heat in. And so there's a different coating. Again, a very thin coating of metal, which you can't see, that reflects the infrared light or the heat. So if you're standing in, your, in, your, in the middle of your living room, looking at this window, your body's at 98 degrees Fahrenheit, the room may be at 70 degrees Fahrenheit, you're emitting infrared heat, infrared light or heat. Um, and that infrared light is being bounced back off the window, keeping the heat inside the room, keeping you warmer than you would be without it. And these coatings have different names, but um, there's low E180 on the outside, low E I89 on the inside, but you really want the combination of them because this combination of having the two 
uh, air pockets, which, which insulate, plus the low E coatings on the inside and the outside, give you eight times better insulation than a single glazed window without low E coatings, which is what we had in our house um, because it was built in 1974. And that was the technology of the day. So it's easy to get carried away with these all, all this technical fancy stuff like heat pumps and, and solar panels I'll tell you about in a minute, but windows make a huge difference. And low E triple glazed windows really are kind of like the unsung heroes of the zero carbon revolution. Um, without having uh, low E triple glazed windows, it would be very hard for us to have got our house to a zero carbon footprint. So this is a different way of thinking about how this works. This is me standing outside in the winter time, sorry, in the summertime, um, wearing a t-shirt. Um, and that's like a single glazed window, okay? It's not really insulating, it's just a barrier to the wind. I put on that green sweater, I've got like a double glazed window. I've got one layer of air trapped against my body. Put on a second sweater, that blue one, I've got two layers of air trapped against my body. That's like a triple glazed window. Three sheets, two airs, two, uh, two uh, air pockets. It's the air that does the insulating. It's not the glass, it's not the plastic, it's the air that is doing the insulating. Air is an excellent insulator and trapping a layer of it. It's like putting on a sweater, keeps you warm, keeps the heat inside, uh, keeps the heat out in the summertime, keeps the heat in in the wintertime. And then if I put a shiny four space blanket around me, like one of those emergency space blankets, that's like the low E coatings. That's reflecting the infrared light or the heat back to my body, keeping me nice and warm. So that's how triple glazed windows work. Now, as I, I mentioned, the, the, uh, the low cost fit from the inside window inserts. If you have windows like this, this is upstairs at our rental property. It's this traditional New England style colonial with um, the double hung sash windows that go up and down like this. Um, they are very drafty and uh, they are very poorly insulated. Um, and what I did, you can see on the left hand picture there, there's a, a thin frame inside window frame. That is a, a window insert, it's made of glass. Um, with a aluminium uh, uh, rail around the outside, which is sealed in place with a, with a foam rubber strip. So you literally just push it into the window frame. You order them to the size of your window. You push it into the window frame. It sits there by friction. Um, and this adds about R1 to, or one R, between R1 and R2 to a window, which can double the, um, the insulation value of the window and it blocks the drafts. Now, if any of you have got double hung sash windows or even single hung sash windows, they are incredibly drafty. It's almost impossible to seal that gap where the two panes move up against each other. Um, so, so sealing the, the entire window frame with one of these window inserts uh, greatly reduces the drafts coming through the window. And because of the extra insulation, it reduces the drafts coming down the window as well. And you can see this in these uh, two pictures on the right. Uh, these are taken with an infrared camera. So it's measuring temperature. And you can just about read in the center of the picture uh, in, in the middle picture there, 63.3 degrees Fahrenheit, that has the window insert. Uh, on the, on the right-hand side, there's no window insert, it's just a single glazed window. The outdoor temperature here was about 30 degrees the day I did this. Uh, on the right, it's about 40 degrees. Uh, in the middle there, with the window insert, it's about 63 degrees. That's a huge difference. If you were sitting in front of this window, the, the, the uh, single glazed window, your feet would be freezing cold. There's so much draft coming down that window, and probably coming through it as well, because it's sing just single glazed, um, you will, you'll feel very cold on your face and very cold on your feet. But if you're sitting in a room with a 63 degree Fahrenheit window, the, the thermostat was set to 70, um, you're not really gonna feel cold at all. There's not enough of a temperature difference to get a real cold draft down that window and the, the window insert blocks the, the drafts coming through the window. These cost about 200 bucks per window for a 10 square foot window. Uh, and the payback is about five years. Um, so these are very good value for money. Um, these even work for, for renters, uh, for tenants. If you've got, if you've got a rented a house with a, with a drafty set of windows, um, you, can, you can buy these windows and then take them with you um, uh, when you leave. Um, so for details on this, again, please, please, please see the book, which you'll all get for free, uh, particularly which types of low E glass I recommend, for which locations a north facing window needs a different type of low E to a south facing window, for instance. Um, and I don't recommend that stretchy film. I have tried it. The, the stuff you uh, use a hairdryer to um, stretch out in the window, it, do, it does, does work. Um, but uh, when you take it off, uh, the, the, the glue strips took off the paint off the window frame. So um, I really don't recommend it because of that. It, but it's not that it doesn't work. Uh, you're much better off paying a bit extra 
and getting these fit from the inside windows. I recommend the ones made of glass. You can get them with plastic, like uh, acrylic plastic. I recommend the glass, it looks much better. And because it's glass, you can get a low E coating. You can't get low E coatings on plastic, it will melt the plastic, um, but you can get it on the glass and that gets you a better looking window and, um, and uh, better insulation because of that low E coating on the glass. So that's all in chapter four. Uh, let's just pause here, Mina, and Mina take a couple of questions on uh, triple glaze windows. Yep. Um, can you repeat how many windows were purchased for $4,500? And if you don't mind, please share the manufacturer if it was a consideration. Uh, yes, manufacturer is definitely a consideration because there are, you know, windows go from kind of, uh, I don't know, Chevrolet to Ferrari. There's, there's a lot of different types of, of, of windows. The manufacturers we used, uh, we used uh, two different manufacturers. One is called Loewen, L-O-E-W-E-M, which are made in Canada. Um, you may have noticed it's colder in Canada. They have a lot more experience with triple glazed low E windows than US companies. And I, I did talk to people like Marvin and Anderson, and um, I forget the third one. And, uh, and they just didn't know very much about triple glazing. They, they were really good at double glazing, but did not understand triple glazing much at all. Whereas I, I called the guys in Canada like, oh yeah, triple glaze, we do it, we do it every day because it's much colder in Canada and they, they really need it in Canada. Um, and also uh, Lowen makes those really nice, those wood frames, that's a wood called Douglas fir. And Douglas fir is like the white pine of Canada. It's sort of the weed tree that grows everywhere, but it has this much nicer, in my opinion, colored wood it has this sort of peaches and cream coloration. Whereas white pine tends to be very pale, almost insipid. So um, the cheapest wood you can usually get is pine, but not if you buy them from Canada. If you buy them from Canada, you get this beautiful vertical grain Douglas fir that, that we got, which I think looks much better. Um, uh, so, so that was the one manufacturer. The other one was called um, Sierra Pacific. They're a US manufacturer based in California, I think. Um, and if you wanna buy a pine window, if you're gonna paint the window, you don't care what the wood is, okay? In which case you wanna get pine. Um, always get it clad on the outside in aluminium because that will stop it from uh, leaking, peeling, never have to paint it. It's a, it's a you, you do not want to just get painted wooden windows on the outside. So always get the outside clad with aluminium, the inside, whatever you want. Uh, if you're gonna paint it, get pine. It's the cheapest wood you can get. If you want the wood to look nice, I, I really like the look of the vertical grain Douglas fir, in which case get it from Lowen because it's much cheaper there because it's the weed tree in Canada. Uh, if you're gonna go with something fancier like oak or maple or something, that's gonna cost you a lot more. Um, uh, so that was, that was the two manufacturers. It was Sierra Pacific um, for pine windows because so, so, uh, we, we did this in our rental house and we painted those. So, we, so there was no point buying expensive wood. And for our house where I am today, uh, we use the vertical grain Douglas fir from um, from Lowen. And there was another part of your question. I forget what it was. It was, so, can you read it again, Mina? I forgot it too. Um, let's see. Maybe you can come um, back to it at the end. There was something else yeah. in your question that I didn't answer. Okay. Those, those are the two manufacturers we used, uh, Sierra Pacific oh, and Lowen. How many windows did you get for $4,500? Uh, so, so the $4,500 was the additional cost of replacing all my windows with triple glazed compared to replacing them with double glaze. So it was not the cost of um, a single window. Uh, the total bill for all the windows we replaced was, um, I think it was $70,000, a lot of money. We have a lot of windows in our house. Uh, all the windows on the ground floor are essentially um, sliding glass patio doors. So we've got a lot of glass in our house. Um, so, so replacing our windows was probably more expensive than most of us would be. Uh, so it was about $70,000. Um, it costs almost as much to get them installed as it does to buy them. And this is why the additional cost of the triple glaze is worth it because the additional cost of a third sheet of glass compared to two sheets of glass is very small when you add up the total bill for the wood framing um, and the installation as well. The glass is a very small component of the cost and therefore it's worth getting that extra pane of glass and getting the low E coatings. Okay. Um, can triple glazing be imitated with double glazing and interior insertable storm windows? Yes, that's exactly what I showed you there in the upstairs of the rental property, where we have uh, single glazed windows um, and uh, we added those window inserts. In the book, I actually, I go through four different manufacturers. I tried them all out and I measured the R value, how, how much insulation they were. They all blocked the drafts but they had quite different R values. And I ended up with the, with, with the, the best one being the glass one. Most of them are actually plastic. The glass one, which I actually bought from a place in Connecticut, I actually drove down and picked them up and, and brought them home. 
um, which is much cheaper because they're, they're quite big, these windows. So they actually cost a lot to ship and the cost of shipping can actually be more than the cost of buying the window. So being able to buy them from a place in Connecticut where you can drive down and pick them up actually is a, is a huge bonus. And it happens to be the place that, um, that makes them with glass and has low E coatings. And that company is called Inner Glass, I-N-N-E-R-G-L-A-S-S. -S. And it's all in the book if you want to want to read it. Um, and I, I highly recommend them. They were, they, were, they were not the most expensive windows. There were other companies that were more expensive. Um, so they were very reasonably priced and they were very effective. Okay. A bunch of people want to know um, if inner glass is needed if you have storm windows. How does it compare to a storm window? Um, can you take the inserts out when it's cold outside? Things like that. Uh, yes, you can take the window inserts out. Uh, you can easily just pop them out of the frame. Some people do this and take them out in the summertime because they want to open their windows. Uh, I do not. I just leave them in year round. They provide insulation in the wintertime and insulation in the summertime. Um, and the windows upstairs at, the, at our rental place, we don't really need to open. Uh, they're not the kind of windows you want to open to get a breeze into the house. Um, so, uh, so we leave them in all year round. But people do take them out in the summertime. Um, and uh, there was another part of the question that was like, uh, taking them out, what else was there? Um... Let's see, is, 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 it, is it comparable to having a storm window? Uh, so I think it's better than having a storm window. Um, storm windows are really there to prevent rain and, um, and wind blowing against the, the wooden frame and, and, and um, uh, you know, corroding the paint, um, taking the paint off. That is not the purpose of an interior storm window. They are sometimes called interior storm windows because they look like exterior storms, but in my opinion, they have a very different function. Exterior storms are there to protect from the weather. Interior storms are there to add insulation and to seal out the drafts. Um, they're really very different. Um, but uh, an external storm window uh, will give you some insulation benefit, but the air is not trapped. Uh, whereas the, the inner, the inner uh, fitting window, the air is trapped by a, a, a gasket, essentially a rubber, a rubber gasket or a foam gasket around the outside. Whereas exterior storm windows um, are not designed to be airtight. Um, they may be, you know, fairly airtight, but you're going to get some air movement behind there that's going to reduce the insulation value. So if you're really after insulation and um, noise reduction, they're very good at re reducing noise as well, um, and very good at blocking drafts. I think um, an interior window is going to be better for you than an exterior storm. Exterior storms are really there to, to uh, mitigate weather damage to the wood frame of the window. Okay. Um, are the inserts removable so windows can be opened in the summer? Yes. Yes, they are. Um, you can just pop them out. And people do this. They, they, they store them for the summertime, put them back in for the wintertime. As I said, I don't uh, because the, um, the, uh, the rooms where we, where we have these uh, the window inserts are not used that often. And uh, people don't, don't seem to want to open those windows at all. Um, but, it, but if you do need to open the window, you can just pop out the window insert and open it. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, we're ready to move on. Okay, so let's go to the fourth part, uh, solar panels. This is the second biggest uh, cut in our carbon footprint, about a third or 14 tons a year. The biggest money saver, $5,500 a year, but also the biggest investment, $42,000 compared to the heat pumps, which was about twenty six. dollars The insulation was, was $1,000. Pays yourself in about seven years. The return on investment is about 13% after tax, and I'm producing electricity from my solar panels about between five and eight cents per kilowatt hour, which compares to Eversource or National Grid currently charging about 23 cents. They, are, they have a, a, um, a proposal in front of the Attorney General to raise that to between 29 and 30 cents because the, the price of um, natural gas has gone up and that's the main contributor to the cost of electricity. Um, so the saving now on solar panels is even greater than it was when I did uh, my solar panel. So the return on investment and the money saving is even better today uh, than it was uh, when I put mine in. Now that 7.2 years um, is the uh, payback period, but uh, academic researchers have done comparisons on um, homes with solar panels and home, homes without solar panels. And uh, the increase in house price is somewhere between four and 7%. It's very similar to that for heat pumps. And again, this tends to pay back the cost of the installation of the solar panels so you can now get your house you can now get your investment back when you sell your house so you don't have to wait 7.2 years in your house to get the payback on the um 
on the uh, the savings on the on heating bills. So it now makes financial sense to install solar panels and heat pumps um, if you're going to move even within a few years because they'll increase the price of your house um, compared to uh, not putting them in. This is kind of a breakthrough, really. You now um, not only get paid to cut your carbon footprint, but it increases the price of your house as well. So let me just explain briefly how solar panels work. Uh, sun comes from the left there, hits the solar panel. Some very fancy quantum mechanics goes on. Remember, I'm a geeky physicist, but you really don't care. Electricity just pours out the other end, um, and there's really no maintenance on the solar panel. It just sits there and does its stuff. Um, and then positive and negative leads carry that to the inverter. The type of electricity produced by a solar panel is DC, or direct current, which is the same as a battery produces, and it's also the same as your car uses, but it's not what your house uses. Your house uses AC or alternating current, and so a box, an inverter, converts the DC power to the AC power, feeds it to your meter. You do not cut your connection to the grid. You maintain your connection to your utility company, uh, but now you're getting power from two sources, from your solar panels and from the utility company, and your net meter, you, your utility company will replace your existing one-way meter with a net meter, which records electricity flowing both ways. So it can measure the uh, credit you should be getting on your electricity bill, because sometimes you're going to be producing more power than you're using, and that power is then exported to the grid, so somebody else can be using your zero-carbon power um, during those times when your solar panels are producing more than uh, you're using in your house. Uh, this is from our uh, second solar panel array, actually. 17.6 kilowatts, cost me about $56,000. The federal tax credit was then 30%. It's now 26%, uh, 22%, uh, 26%, I'm sorry, 26%. The mass tax credit is about $1,000. The big, bigger subsidy in Massachusetts was then called SREG. It's now called SMART. I'll explain that in just a minute. And so the, the cost per kilowatt hour, what I mean by this is I took the net cost of my panels, $14,000 in this example, divided it by the guaranteed, guaranteed by the manufacturer, lifetime output of the solar panels. And they're typically guaranteed for 25 years. So just divided one number by the other, and you get five cents per kilowatt hour as what's sometimes called the levelized cost of electricity. And that compares to Eversource at 23 or 24 cents. The net present value or the total profit on this is $29,000 and my return on investment is about 14% per year. Now, that was under the SREC subsidy scheme. The new subsidy scheme is called SMART. SMART is a little less generous than, than SREC, but it's a lot easier to claim. The old one was very difficult to claim. Um, but I've done this recently uh, for clients of mine, and their levelized cost of electricity is between four and six cents per kilowatt hour under the SMART scheme. So even lower than what I'm getting um, under the old SREC scheme. And that is because the price of solar panels has come down significantly in the last few years. Now, I just ordered two arrays with batteries, with internal, internal to the house batteries. And with those batteries, which are also subsidized under the Massachusetts Smart Scheme, the levelized cost of electricity is between six and eight cents per kilowatt hour. So more expensive than just having solar panels alone. But now I've got a battery, and I don't need a backup generator. Uh, you don't need to do all these calculations yourself. Of course, you're welcome to do so if you're comfortable doing discounted cash flow analysis. But if you're not, use the Energy Sage website, uh, and they will compare different bids for you using the same methodology and give you the levelized cost of electricity in cents per kilowatt hour, which I find the most useful way to compare uh, bidders because um, that's what your bill is. Your bill is today um, in, in dollars and cents per kilowatt hour. So it's an easy way to compare one to the other. Now, uh, the cost of electricity from solar panels is so heavily subsidized these days and panels are so cheap that even partly shaded roofs, like my garage, um, can make very low cost electricity. The roof of my garage has about 50% shade. It's got 100 foot pine trees only 50 feet away on the southwest side. So it's not the ideal place for solar panels. But because the panels are so cheap, um, I can make electricity from my garage roof at about 11 cents per kilowatt hour. So it's not as good as my roof of my house, which has perhaps 80% um, sun. Uh, my, my garage has about 50% sun. And so the roof of my house produces power at about five or six cents per kilowatt hour. The roof of my garage produces power at about 11 cents per kilowatt hour. It's still less than half what utilities pay. And if Eversource gets its way with this big price increase, it'll be almost a third of what the new price from Eversource is going to be. So if you've been told in the past that solar didn't make sense on your shady roof or partly shaded roof, revisit it. 
um, even partly shaded roofs and even east facing or west facing roofs can still save you a lot of money today compared to um, uh, uh, to, to paying emphasis or national grid for, for electricity. Um, now these are the um, I'm sorry, I'll get on to the question in a minute. So, so to perform uh, the detailed calculations, it's all in the book. Um, if, you, if you don't have the cash to buy uh, solar panels today, and they, they, it is, is a big chunk of cash up front, uh, you can get leasing deals, which are very good these days. Uh, the leasing rate is about 13 cents per kilowatt hour compared to five to say 11 cents if you're um, buying them yourselves. Um, uh, and uh, I don't recommend solar hot water panels. Uh, too many moving parts, um, and they produce all the hot water in the summertime when you don't really need it, and they produce very little hot water in the wintertime when you do really need it. Um, get multiple quotes, use Energy Sage, see chapter four in the book. Um, and let's just pause here for a couple of questions on solar panels. Okay, so if you can only do one, which one it would, gives you more carbon reduction, geothermal or solar? Um, so if the choice is geoth well, that's a um, uh, that's not such an easy question to answer. I'll, I'll give you the, the direct answer to your question. It's probably going to be geothermal. If you look at what we did on our house, the air source heat pumps had the biggest single cut in our carbon footprint. Solar panels were second, and geothermal will cut more carbon emissions than an air source heat pump. So on a straight comparison of um, just carbon dioxide cut, the geothermal is going to beat the air source heat pumps. And the geothermal is almost certainly going to beat the solar panels as well. Um, but, and this is a very big but, it will cost you a lot more. Uh, on our house, we had a quote for geothermal, it was $98,000. The uh, What we paid for the air source heat pumps was $25,000 for our house, the big house with 5,400 square feet at the rental property with uh, mini split, ductless mini split pumps. It was about $50,000. As, as I said, there's more machinery involved there than there is in just the straightforward ducted system at our house. Um, and so, uh, so the cost of the uh, mini split, uh, ductless mini split system uh, is, is, is quite a bit more expensive per square foot of the house. Um, so, uh, so I would, uh, so I think the, um, you know, the short answer is the, uh, the geothermal will, will cut your carbon emissions the most, but for very few people does it make economic sense. So that, that's, that's, that's my long answer to your question. Got it. Um, is the orientation of the roof a limiting factor when installing solar panels? Um, the orientation of the roof affects the solar panels, no doubt. So a sloped south facing roof is the best. You're pointing it you know, directly towards the sun. That's the best orientation. But if you have a flat roof like I have on my, on my house, a flat roof, the penalty from going from a um, angled uh, south facing roof to a flat roof is only 10%. So my roof produces 90% as much electricity as a south facing sloped roof. The same thing is true of an east facing roof or a west facing roof. So if you have a house that's, that's sort of oriented north south and has an east facing sloped roof and a west facing sloped roof, each side will produce about 90% as much electricity as a south facing roof. This is commonly not understood, even by solar panel installers. Um, and sometimes even north facing roofs um, make, make, make good value for money because uh, a, a north facing roof is a 30% penalty compared to a south facing roof. So you get about 70% as much electricity from a north facing roof as you would from a south facing roof. Um, and so if the economics are what's driving you, and I think you should be paying attention to the economics, um, then um, your economics of a north facing roof, sloped roof will be about 70% as good. So if you're, if you're making uh, electricity from your south facing sloped roof at say five cents per kilowatt hour, um, your north facing roof might be making electricity at seven cents per kilowatt hour. Well, that's still a huge reduction from the 23 or 24 that Eversource or National Grid is charging you. So um, solar panel installers tend not to be as focused on the economics of the solar electricity generation. They're more focused on your bill and replacing your bill with, um, with solar driven electricity. But um, I think you should be paying attention to um, uh, uh, the cost of the electricity being produced by our solar panels, because if you've got more room than you really need to offset your bill, well then get some heat pumps, 
because that'd be really cheap to run off your solar electricity and maybe get an electric vehicle so it'll now be really cheap to run off your solar electricity mm. um, i want to revisit your um you were saying that to for people to go ahead and look at solar panels again even if they're in the shady place because a couple of people said is it worth cutting down trees in order to get more sunlight for solar panels um, so often it is if you don't value the trees. So if the trees are getting old and starting to shed branches or they're so shady on your roof that you're getting um, uh, moss and things growing on your roof, then you've got reasons to cut down your trees. Uh, but most people like trees and they do provide good shade by the house. So, you know, it's sort of, it's sort of swings and roundabouts. Um, I think uh, many people I've, I've met have been reluctant to cut down trees just to get more sun on their roof in the absence of other problems like like uh, moss growing on the roof um, and things like that. Um, so uh, sometimes I do recommend people trim their trees. Uh, so you don't need to actually cut down the tree. Maybe you trim out some of the branches that are causing a lot of shade on your roof. And that's a um, kind of a halfway house where maybe you can get some significant increase in the, the electricity output from your roof without actually cutting down the tree entirely. Okay. How long can your, uh, oh no, that's not right. Um, what do you know about Tesla power walls? I don't know if this goes in this section. <laughs> uh, it may as well, may as well. Um, so I've looked at buying batteries. Um, uh, batteries can now make good economic sense. In other words, they're, they're, they're cheap enough and the subsidies are good enough. The subsidies under the SMART program is an additional subsidy to what you get from solar panels alone. And the subsidy for the battery is actually tied to the output of the solar panel array. So, you, so the bigger your array, the more subsidy you get for the battery. It is not driven by the size of the battery. It's driven by the size of the array. So when you pair a battery with a fairly large solar panel array, I'm talking like a 15 kilowatt um, solar panel array, then the subsidies of the battery become very attractive and can really reduce the price of a battery to um, below that of the cost of having a backup generator. So I don't recommend batteries for, um, I mean, you don't need a battery to store power overnight because you have a, that connection to the grid through your net meter. So um, I have solar panels on the roof of my house, but I'm on my computer right now taking electricity. It's not coming from my solar panels, it's coming from the grid. So by having that grid connection, you're never gonna go without um, electricity even when the, the sun is, is set. Um, so um, so you, you really, you don't need to have a battery to power your house overnight. That's a common misperception. Um, the way to use batteries, in my opinion, is as alternatives to gasoline or diesel or propane fired backup generators. And certainly where I live in Dover, we get power outages all the time. In the wintertime, there's a lot of trees around here and they fall into the power lines. Um, and uh, so pretty much everyone around here has a backup generator. And I do, I do too. Um, but uh, mine is so old now, I can't even get spare parts for it. And so I'm going to be replacing it with a battery instead of buying a new backup generator. And because that battery is being paired with um, a, a 13 kilowatt hour, um, sorry, 13 kilowatt um, uh, solar panel array, the subsidy on, um, on the batteries will be quite significant. And uh, so my levelized cost of electricity from that array is between six and eight cents per kilowatt hour, which is not as cheap as just having the, the array on its own. That would be more like five or six cents per kilowatt hour. Um, but it's still much cheaper than uh, paying for Eversource electricity. And I've now got a backup generator, well, a backup battery that replaces a generator um, uh, included. Mm -hmm. um, a couple of people have a question about um, solar panels on flat roofs especially with snow, you know, New England. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so I've got a flat roof and I've got solar panels. It's not an issue. Um, when we get heavy snow, I just leave it there. In the first winter, I actually went up there and brushed the snow off. Uh, but what I realized is because the sun is, is very low in the sky in the wintertime, I'm making very little electricity, even on a sunny day in winter. The vast majority of my electricity is made on sunny days in the summer not sunny days in the winter. So I figured out I was actually earning less than minimum wage for every hour I was up there, I was saving less than $7 um, in terms of uh, electricity that I could have produced by cleaning the panels, so I stopped doing it. So, so I'll go for periods of you know, up to a week in the middle of winter when my panels are covered with thick snow and I'm producing almost nothing. 
uh, from the panels. But in terms of dollars, it's tiny. It's a, you know, a, a few tens of dollars per year are lost because of the, um, the, the snow on the panels. So I, I just don't even bother anymore. And um, uh, all, um, all solar panel installers will do a calculation for the, the, the load, the weight that your roof can bear. Um, and uh, and, and uh, I just had a letter from a, a structural engineer saying, yeah, the roof can bear the extra weight of the solar panels, even, even with snow on top of them. So it's not an issue from a weight point of view, although I would advise you to get the installers to do that check. Almost all of them will do this for you anyway, but just put it on the checklist of things to ask the solar panel installer um, is to do that weight load calculation on the roof. Um, uh, but it's, it's, it's uh, not an issue from a uh, shade, the, the snow shading the panel's point of view. Um, I just leave it there and wait till it melts off. Okay. And so would the solar panels lie flat or would they be angled? Yeah. So, so on my flat roof, they are flat. You can do either. You can, you can have them angled on a flat roof or you can have them flat on a flat roof. Um, I think it's better to have them flat on a flat roof for two reasons. One, you can't see them. And, and many people don't like the look of solar panels. And so having them flat is, is a benefit from that point of view. And um, uh, it's, uh, it's, it actually produces, um, like I said, about there's only a 10% penalty to having flat panels, flat on the roof, horizontal panels on the roof, compared to angled at 45 degrees or thereabouts facing towards the sun. So the penalty is, is tiny. And because you can now put the panels next to each other, I calculated I can actually get more kilowatt hours of electricity from my roof with flat panels than I could with, with um, uh, tilted panels. Because with tilted panels, you have to put, leave a, a gap between each row. And when you've only got a certain amount of space on your roof, like all roofs have, then um, that's a big trade-off. And I, I did the calculations, it was better to have the, roof, have the panels lie flat with just enough room to walk between the rows um, rather than have them tilted and then each one shading the next ones. So, you, but you do have a choice, but it's, it's up to you really. And I think most people just prefer the aesthetic look of having the panels flat. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to let you know that we've been here for about 90 minutes and we do have a bunch of questions, just giving you a sense of our time. Uh, okay, let me quickly go through the, the conclusion here. And then we'll get to the question because that's usually the most important part for people. So I'll just take me a couple minutes to go through this. So, um, so this question is a slide you can download from my website. Uh, let's talk about how we put all four of these things together to give ourselves that zero carbon footprint. Um, so here's the cost of heating with different heating fuels. Everyone knows electricity is really expensive. Natural gas is the cheapest. But the electricity from my rooftop solar panels is about seven cents per kilowatt hour. If I use that to run a heat pump, which has that two and a half times efficiency, now I'm heating the house at a cost of less than two cents per kilowatt hour of heat in the house. That's the seven cents divided by the uh, efficiency of the heat pump or, or 2.5, that gives you about um, something just under two cents per kilowatt hour of heat in the house compared to five cents for natural gas. So that combination of solar panels for cheap electricity and heat pumps for efficient heating is the cheapest way to heat your house today. Far cheaper than heating with natural gas, which historically has been the cheapest way to heat your home. Um, so the key to going zero is to put all these things together. It's to cut your house's energy use, cutting it with insulation and air sealing, cutting it with triple glazed windows, either the real windows or the fit from the inside um, uh, window inserts, cut it with heat pumps and they're two and a half times efficiency, and then generate it with solar panels, cheap, electricity from solar panels, and of course, with a zero carbon footprint. Now, that is the optimal order in which you do it. That's not how I did it. As I, I said at the start, I did it with the heat pumps and, and solar panels first. I did it almost the wrong way around. But having done this now, I know this is the optimal way in which to do it. Um, I won't talk about tenants right now. Um, so uh, let's just uh, one more slide and then we'll um, be at the end. So I've talked mostly about money. and I've talked about carbon footprint. But let me just talk briefly about health. So here is a, a picture, um, uh, all the fossil fuels at the top, coal, oil, natural gas, and biomass, with on the left, the death rate from accidents and air pollution, and on the right, the greenhouse gas emissions. And at the bottom, you see hydropower, nuclear, wind, and solar, and it's night and day. Both the death rate from, from accidents and mining coal and oil and the air pollution caused by burning them, that's the sulfur dioxide, 
the nitric oxides and the soot, um, uh, kill people with asthma and other uh, chronic diseases um, through the air they breathe, and yet the comparable numbers for, um, for uh, wind and solar and hydropower are almost zero. So this is both important for our health collectively and individually in the house and, um, and uh, saving the planet from global warming and saving money for all of us. So just to summarize everything we've talked about tonight, um, the money saved in the middle, these tables are on the book, um, the carbon dioxide on the right, uh, there are similar tables for return on investment and net present value if you wanna see that, but this really can deliver the triple bottom line, zero pollution for the people, zero carbon for the planet, and zero bills for the profit. Um, uh, I won't talk about uh, new houses tonight, don't think we have time. Um, and this slide, um, if you wanna take a, take a screenshot of this or print it out, um, this is also available on my website, but uh, here's where all the free stuff is. You can get a PDF file of the slides that I've used tonight. If you wanna just go back and check something uh, from my website, there's a YouTube recording of a previous webinar. Uh, Mina's live streaming this, and this will be recorded for this particular webinar as well. Uh, there's also 300 questions and answers written up on the website, which you can search. Um, they're organized by heat pumps, insulation, triple glazed windows and solar panels. These are all questions that people have asked me on prior webinars, and I've written up the answers there, and they're all posted on the website. The free book you can get from the website, Green Zero Carbon Home is the address. Um, uh, just, just order it for iPad or Kindle, whichever one you want, um, and then uh, just put in the code APL for Ashland Public Library, and it'll be free. Um, this occasionally does not work. If it doesn't work, email me. My email address is at the bottom there, dgreen at greenzerocarbon.com. Um, and I will email you the file uh, if, if for some reason it doesn't work. Because sometimes browsers don't like talking to each other and it just doesn't work. The paperback book, if you want it, um, and I know some people do, uh, is not free because that costs me real money to, to print it. Um, and you can also get a special edition of, of the book for free, which I, I, I did during the COVID lockdown because a lot of people were stuck at home kind of twiddling their thumbs. And so I, I, I list those four things that are easy, quick, simple to do that you can do on your own without needing to hire a contractor. Um, so uh, that's everything I've got to say um, from me. I'm sorry it's gone on a bit long, but I will stay on and uh, continue to take people's questions as long as you, as long as you want to keep asking them. Okay, thank you so much, David. So we're just going to get right to the questions. We're going to start right from the beginning. You want me to stop sharing my screen, Mina? Oh, sure. Yeah. Let me do that. I will send out all of these links and everything tomorrow um, with the YouTube video link and everything. So don't worry that you're missing it. It will you will get it. Um, so Beverly asked early, early on that her house is old and historic. They don't use solar. Can they use geothermal? Uh, so, so yes is the answer. Uh, if you've got an old home and historic, let me take it piece by piece. So in historic districts, the biggest issue is often the windows that the historic commission um, doesn't want you to, to change the look of the house. And so you can't put storm windows on the outside. They often won't even let you change the windows to put in triple glazing. So for historic houses in historic districts, uh, window inserts are, are really a, a, a super thing because the historic commission doesn't care what it looks like from the inside. They only care what it looks like from the outside. So, so, the, so, so that's a really great way of reducing your energy use completely, regardless of what you then do. And your question was about geothermal. Um, you can definitely do it um, if the uh, if the historic commission um, doesn't mind. They probably won't because um, it's just it's all underground. So I don't see how they would they would mind about that. Um, it's just expensive. That's all. And I think if you've um, if you've got air conditioning units today and just replacing. AC units with heat pumps, as we did on, on our house, um, that's going to be much cheaper for you than geothermal, but geothermal will work. And if that's all you can do in your area, um, then uh, then I, I, I would do that if it, if it makes economic sense for you. Solar is sort of 50-50. Some uh, historic commissions will not allow it, particularly on the front of the house where it's visible from the street, but some will on the back of the house. Um, if you can't do, do solar at all, I would recommend just tighten up a building envelope as much as you can, seal the drafts as much as you can, get as much insulation as you can, maybe go for the geothermal or the air source heat pumps. If you can't do solar, you can't do solar. Um, the next best option if you can't do solar, uh, you can actually get it, um, you can sign up with a company called NextAmp, and there are several others. There are community source solar suppliers um, that will 
that will uh, you can you can switch your um, your supply of electricity. Anyone can do this. A tenant can do this. A, um, a homeowner doesn't matter where you are. Historic district, not historic district, and they build solar panel arrays in Massachusetts, and you buy a chunk of their array essentially, um, and they they sell you the net metering credits um, off, um, and that gives you a twelve and a half percent discount off the Eversource rate, and it's a hundred percent solar. So it's not as cheap as putting your own solar panels on your own roof, um, but sometimes you can't. And if you've got a historic commission that won't let you do it, you can't do it. So um, that's the next best option is to go with a company like Nexam or uh, one of the other community source solar suppliers in Massachusetts. Um, are your heat pumps geothermal? You had, I think you said no. They're air sourced heat pumps, which are not geothermal. Geothermal is sometimes called ground sourced. It's just the only difference is whether it takes the heat from the ground or the heat from the air. Um, but that's it. The technology is the same. Um, it's just where the, the source of the payments come from. So it's the source of the source of the, um, the heat comes from. This is my um, coworker, or my partner in crime for some of these programs, Lara Villamote from the Framingham Public Library. She's been in, you know, helping out with questions and everything. So she's just going to hang out with us. Right. Um, Margaret asks, would the savings be worth it for a really small house? I think we were at the heat pumps at this where the electric bill has averaged around $67 a month. Uh, that's, a, that's a good question. The, the only way to really know that is actually sort of do, do a financial model of the house, which is what I, I do do for consulting clients, which I'm, I said I'm not really doing anymore because I'm, I'm doing full-time work now at a biotech company. Um, but um, I would say if the bills are that low, it's going to be difficult uh, to make it make it pay. Uh, at Sixty-seven bucks a month—that's really not very much. Um, not very much electricity. So I would tend to focus on things like uh, draft ceiling and insulation, and uh, uh, and doing whatever makes sense for your windows. And so if you're going to be replacing your windows anyway, it makes sense to replace them with triple glazed rather than double glazed. But if you're not replacing your windows, if they're in perfectly good shape, then I'd recommend the window inserts, particularly if your windows are drafty or if the neighborhood is noisy and you want to just cut down from noisy neighbors or, um, or a noisy street or something like that. But I, I would focus on those things first. With, with, with an electricity bill that low, um, it's unlikely that, um, that it would make sense for you. Okay. Um, how does one figure out whether to insulate the basement ceiling or the basement walls? So the, the main difference is if you use the basement as living space. So some people have a laundry room down the basement or have a uh, like a TV room or something down the basement. If you're using it as living space, you're better off insulating the walls. Um, and the easiest way to do that is use something like Roxel, a rock wall board, and um, you can do it yourself or you can hire a contract to do it. You just screw it into the rafters. It's about two inches thick. You screw it in, it adds about um, R8 to the wall, uh, and then you just plaster it over and paint it, it looks really nice. Um, uh, or, uh, or the insulating the floor is harder. Um, sometimes when new houses are built, they actually put um, uh, like expanded polystyrene foam under the floor, uh, under the concrete floor these days, but you, you can't retrofit that. So the best thing to do that's economically sensible is just to add a thick pad under the carpet, uh, like a, a half inch pad or so, or three quarter inch pad um, we'll add probably R2 or R3 to your floor, and then a nice thick carpet, we'll add another R2 probably. So you can get reasonable insulation on your floor and good insulation on your walls with uh, Roxel or, um, or uh, fiberglass boards, um, pretty cheap um, and, uh, and cost effective um, if you're gonna be using it as living space. If you're not using it as living space, if you're storing stuff down there, then you're better off um, putting uh, fiberglass up in the, uh, the, the rafters, the ceiling of the basement, because that will really insulate the house and keep the heat up in the house and your basement will get colder, but your luggage doesn't mind if it gets a bit colder. It's only people that mind if it gets a bit colder. Mm -hmm. um, can I just ask David, do you have a phone or something that's dinging? Or is that me? No, no what it is, is, is people are actually downloading the book on my website <laughs> and it sends me an email every time that's hilarious. Okay, it? The ping. So I'm sorry about that, but uh, just okay. try to ignore it for now. It's, it's no. a good sign. It's like pe people are downloading the book. That's a good thing. <laughs> That's awesome. Okay, Laura's going to ask the next question. 
Hello, David. Hello. Thank you so much for your presentation tonight. Lots of fabulous information, and we've got lots of fabulous questions for you. So me and I are going to take turns. Okay. Um, so we have somebody who says they've never used their AC and they can't install solar because they thankfully have too many trees, but they don't want to continue to use gas. Does it still make sense for them to install a heat pump and mini splits? Um, so so you, you've never used AC, so you don't really care about the air conditioning function of a heat pump. You're really thinking about only the, uh, the heating function. Um, and uh, the first question I would ask is, are you on natural gas or are you on heating oil? <laughs> they, did it, they, they said they don't want to continue using gas. So that makes me oh, think- Okay, so, so if, if yeah. you're on natural gas, um, then switching to a heat pump often does not make economic sense. If you just want to cut carbon footprint, yes, it will cut your carbon footprint. But the cost of Eversource or National Grid electricity is so high in Massachusetts at 23, 24 cents per kilowatt hour, and it's going up to 28 or 29 cents per kilowatt hour, um, that um, you won't save any money um, unless you have cheap electricity. Electricity is so expensive from the utility that even after the efficiency of the heat pump, it will still be costing you more than heating with natural gas. And I've had people on webinars before who said, um, you know, I have to keep my house at 65 degrees now. I used to keep it at 70 degrees because the bills are so high in the wintertime because I took out my fossil fuel furnace because the heat pump guy told me to. Um, and now they've got this dilemma of paying through the nose for the electricity to run their heat pumps or keeping the house much cooler than they'd really like. So this is why I don't recommend um, taking out your fossil fuel furnace. And if you're going to be switching from uh, natural gas to uh, ever source electricity, it's going to cost you a lot, probably a, a doubling of your overall heating bill, your electricity bill and, and uh, natural gas bill combined. Um, the way to do it is to do both, is to do solar panels, get the cheap electricity and use that to power your heat pump with its two and a half times efficiency. And now you've got cheap heat in the house and you've got a zero carbon footprint. So that's, it's, you really have to put the things together. And of course, if you're gonna do that, the first thing you wanna do is insulate the house well, seal the drafts, deal with the windows, whatever you're gonna do. If the windows are in perfectly good shape, get the window inserts. If they're not, and you're gonna replace them anyway, replace them with triple glazed, not with double glazed. So that dinging sound makes me think of it's a wonderful life. I just had to say that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'll take that. <laughs> Um, so Michael says that he suspects you count on net metering with grid connection during the night, et cetera. What do you do when a storm causes a grid blackout? Um, so so uh, during, a, during a grid outage, uh, we are without electricity today, even though we have solar panels. Now, as I mentioned, we're gonna be getting a battery and because of the battery, the battery is allowed to be connected um, to, uh, to, to the house even during a grid outage. Now, during a grid outage, by law, your solar panels must automatically disconnect from the grid. And so there's a switch inside the inverter that when it detects a lack of power coming from the grid, it automatically switches off the uh, solar panels. Otherwise, what happens is your electricity is going out of the grid and that line worker is gonna get electrocuted when they think the power lines are down, but they're not down because your electricity is coming through them. So by law, your, uh, your panels must disconnect from the grid. But if you have a battery, you can reconnect your panels to your house behind the grid. So you maintain that, that uh, separation so you can't electrocute the line workers, but you can get power from the battery and the panels. And this is exactly what I'm doing um, at my house with the, the, the new battery I've bought to go with my, uh, my garage array. That will replace my decrepit uh, propane emergency generator. And I'll now be able to power my house from my battery and recharge my battery from my solar panels, even during a grid outage. Mm -hmm. That had come up in another question too. I'll, I'll find that one, Laura. Um, how are you able to track the individual contributions for each of the four measures when they interoperate together as a system? Um, they do, but I did them in sequence. So it was real <laughs> easy. I, the first thing I did was the solar panels. I measured the electricity and the, uh, the heating oil use. Then the next thing I did was the, um, the heat pumps. And again, I measured before and after. 
uh, and then I added the installation I did before and after. And the final thing I did was the um, the, uh, the triple glazed windows that I had before and after. So it was it was easy because I did I, I didn't do them all at once. I did them in turn. Okay, that makes sense. Would you share with us the manufacturer of your heat pumps? Yes, I've got so I've got experience with two different types of heat pumps. The ones in our house, which are the ducted system, are from uh, Bosch. B-O-S-E-H, a German company, a very high quality manufacturer. Um, and at the time I bought them, which was 2016, they were the most efficient and the most cost effective um, heat pumps you could buy. Now, today, that um, the king of the hill is Bryant, B-R-Y-A-N-T. And I've never purchased a Bryant unit, so I don't know this. But other people who have rave about them. They are very efficient. They're more efficient than my Bosch heat pumps. Um, and they were about the same price, maybe even slightly cheaper um, on, a, on a recent quote I did for someone. So, um, so these days, I think I'd probably go with Bryant. Bosch is certainly a very good choice in the, um, in the ducted heat pump systems. In the ductless heat pump systems, Mitsubishi is not exactly the only game in town, but they're definitely the market leader. Uh, Fujitsu is also a, a big player. Um, there are very few other companies in that space. Um, and Mitsubishi tends to have the, the lion's share. Their, their pumps, uh, their heat pumps do tend to be the most efficient. I'm not convinced they're the most cost effective. As I mentioned earlier, my, um, my uh, ducted heat pumps for, for my house were $26,000 for a 5,400 square foot house. My ductless system for our rental property was $50,000 for a, um, a smaller house, 3,400 square feet, because we had to have eight different heads uh, inside the house because there's there's a lot of rooms. Um, we don't have an open plan structure um, in that house. So you have to have a lot of equipment and the equipment just costs money. So if you've got, a good, if you've got an open plan, um, open plan house, you can get away with fewer heads on the inside um, and so reduce the cost. Um, but if you have a lot of rooms and a lot of doors and things uh, closing off the rooms, you're going to need some source of heat in, in most of those rooms. Mm -hmm. Um, which is actually interesting because Nancy asks, if you have three heating zones, does that mean you need three heat pumps? Um, probably is the answer. Um, there, there are ways you can kind of jury rig it and have one heat pump run, run two zones, but um, you tend to get less efficiency that way. So almost every contractor will, will recommend you have a separate unit for the different zones. Um, it's not essential, but it tends to be that way, yeah. Okay. I think you touched on this a little bit already in terms of creating needed electricity with solar. Um, if not, if when you are not, are you accounting for the carbon created by your electric company? Yes, exactly. Yes. So, so um, I, I use the, um, there, these are published figures for the ISO New England grid for the carbon footprint of uh, electricity produced and uh, consumed in New England. And I use those numbers to calculate the amount of electricity the amount of carbon footprint from the extra electricity I was using to run the heat pumps, say, um, and that was sort of the that was the uh, increase in carbon footprint from using electricity, and then offset that with the decrease in carbon footprint from not burning heating oil anymore. That's how I did the calculation. Interesting math. <laughs> <laughs> I I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a kind of a geek, you know. I've got that degree in physics, so I actually kind of. You know, like doing this stuff and the, the financial stuff is kind of comes easy to me because I've, I've been in business for 20, 30 years now. Oh, okay. Um, so it's not for like the every, like the uh, lay person, I guess, or just, we can figure well, it out. Well, I think, I think, I think there's, there's some truth to that, that Mina, because like I said, when I started this, I went to the library and I went to the Dover town library and said, have you got any books on, on cutting a carbon footprint? And they pointed me to the shelf and there wasn't anything. Well, there's a couple of books, but they really weren't useful at all. There were no, no calculations based off the laws of physics, no calculations based off the laws of economics and financing. So I found it kind of useless. And that's why I wrote the books I did. I wrote them in plain English using um, simple fin financial terms, money saved, money spent, um, to try to make this as understandable as possible, because you can easily get lost in the jargon in all of this. And uh, if, you, if you cut it down to what it really is, it's not that complicated. 
but there are so many people in the industry, the heat pump installers, the uh, insulation guys, the solar panel guys, they don't really have the, um, the fluency I think you need to be able to compare one to the other. You can compare one heat pump manufacturer to another heat pump manufacturer, that's fairly easy. But comparing heat pumps with solar panels, wow, that's tough. So I just try to do it all in terms of numbers, in terms of how many tons of carbon dioxide can you save and how much money can you save? That's like a more universal language that everyone can understand. And that's, and that's why I think, um, I think my, my book's been, been so popular because I try to make it easy for people to understand. I think you do. Um, someone looked for a ceiling mounted mini split three years ago, but they were told they didn't have enough clearance. Uh, can you speak about the space requirements, especially for the unit you showed? Yeah. Yeah, that is true. So at the rental house where I showed you that ceiling mounted unit up in the up in the ceiling there, um, that is actually inserted from above. So there's a kind of a crawl space up there. It's not really an attic, a crawl space where um, the workers were able to get access and to fit the heat pump in between the rafters. We have standard 10 inch rafters up there um, and on a standard 16 inch spacing. And they're able to fit the heat pump unit, which is designed to fit a standard 10 inch wide rafter that's on 16 inch centers, uh, they, they fitted it there. But if you don't have 10 inch rafters and they're not 16 inches apart, then you probably aren't gonna be able to do it. And you have to go with a wall mounted or a floor mounted system rather than a ceiling mounted system. Mm -hmm. Dan asks, what type of heat pump do you replace for replace? Did I just lose my question? Yeah. <laughs> replace for replacement of an existing ducted forced air HVAC with underfloor air downstairs and high wall registers upstairs. Um, so that's a pretty standard setup. Okay, it's a standard ducted um, heating and cooling system for a house. So I, I think given given that it's a pretty standard system, I would be going for efficiency. And um, like I said, for, for my house, I bought the Bosch system, which is the most efficient at the time. Um, it's now uh, Bryant is the most efficient one on the market today, and they get a very good reputation for reliability and service and everything. Um, and so if I was going to do it again, I'd probably buy the Bryant system today, not the Bosch system, but Bosch is great. I definitely recommend it. I've had no trouble with my heat pumps whatsoever. Um, I've heard very similar things about Bryant. They are more efficient now, and they're about the same price. Um, I paid 26000 for mine, and I think the Bryant one would have been maybe twenty three or 24000 Okay, thank you. Speaking of servicing the equipment, do you still service your furnace or boiler annually, given that you only use it about 10 days a year? Uh, no, it's a short answer. It's sort of, it's once every few years now. Uh, and my furnace is not efficient at all. It's only 75% efficient. Most uh, oil furnaces are 85 or 90%. Most gas furnaces are 90 or 95% efficient. Um, but, um, so, uh, but I haven't replaced it because it's, it's, it, I only use it 10 days a year. Why would I spend ten thousand dollars and get a whole new, nice, you know, ninety-five percent efficient system? But I'm only going to use it ten days a year. So I've just kept my dinosaur fossil fuel furnace. Uh, it's huge. It's made of steel. It's like a tank down in the basement. But I don't care. I'm not going to spend ten grand to get a new furnace that I use only ten days a year. I'll, I'll suffer the inefficiency for the next few years until eventually it dies and has to be replaced. Mm -hmm. Um, Rod said he lives in the Bay Area where temperatures often exceed 110 degrees in the summer. And so do you think a, a heat pump can handle getting the house down to about 70 degrees? Or do you think that um, you should get an AC unit to supplement? Um, so the first thing I'd look at is actually the insulation before mm -hmm. I look at the heat pump, because um, insulation and uh, the same thing goes for windows. I'll come back to that. But the thing about insulation is it, it most people think of insulation as being for a cold for a cold winter you know it keeps the heat inside the house but in the hot weather you need to keep the heat out it's the same thing mm -hmm. you need insulation and you need triple glazed windows you need the same low e triple glazed windows you need to keep the heat in in um in uh, in in massachusetts you need to keep the heat out in arizona or in in, in the bay area so it's the same thing so before i go and um spend a lot of money for like a double AC and heat pump system, I'd look at the insulation and my thermal envelope, and do I have a lot of um, drafts coming through the windows or poor insulation if it's a single glazed window, maybe you add that window insert, or if you're gonna replace them, 
anyway, replace them with triple glaze, not double glaze. And that way you're going to reduce the amount of heat or cool that your house demands um, to keep it at a certain temperature. And once you've done that, um, you'll probably find you, you'll be within the range of a good quality heat pump, both on the air conditioning side and the, and the heating side. Um, I, I don't think that my heat pumps have any less cooling capacity than a similarly sized um, dedicated AC unit. When they operate in AC mode, they are an air conditioner. So you, and the, your, your heating contractor should do something for you. Now in the Bay Area, I don't know what the code is, but in Massachusetts, the code requires the um, heat pump installer to do something called a manual J calculation. A manual J is just fancy speak for doing the calculations on how much heating and cooling you actually need based off the amount of insulation you've got mm -hmm. and, and, and the weather. So, uh, so if you do the manual J calculation and all contractors around here said, are required to do it, then the system will be sized for the heat load or the cool load in your house. Um, and that, that's the way to, um, to, uh, to, to sort of fix the problem. I, I, I think there'll be very few circumstances where you need to have both a heat pump and an air conditioning unit. I think you just want to get, you know, do the insulation and the windows first, and then um, just get it sized right for the uh, the amount of insulation you've got. Great, thank you. If you only have a heat pump, would your pipes freeze on a really frigid day? Um, I mean, water pipes. I presume what you mean is water pipes. Um, I, I, I would say no, and unless I mean your water pumps aren't going to freeze unless it gets down to 32 degrees Fahrenheit. You'd be miserable, right, living in a house at, at that kind of temperature. If if you're getting close to freezing in one place in the house, maybe in the basement, better to have a small amount of supplemental heat there, uh, like a, like a small fan heater on a thermostat, just to keep it at say 40 degrees there. If you're in danger of getting close to the uh, the freezing point of water. Um, but otherwise, I think if you're, if you're keeping the house at 65, 70 degrees um, with, with a heat pump, it's going to be keeping the whole of the house at that kind of temperature. Um, the only um, uh, circumstance I'd be a bit wary of is if you do what I did and insulate the ceiling of your basement to keep the heat up in the house, it is going to cool down the basement. You've got less heat leaking into the basement now than you used to have. Now, ours... Uh, cooled by about eight degrees Fahrenheit. It used to be about 60 degrees, and now it sometimes gets down to the mid 50s. Um, but even so, it's well above freezing. And um, so we've never had issues with frozen pipes in our house. But, uh, but I understand if you do, I think the most cost effective way to avoid frozen pipes is to put a small electric heater down there with a thermostat on it. You can just buy these from uh, Walmart or something or Amazon just get one with a thermostat set the thermostat to say 50 degrees and then that will always keep the basement from from freezing and freezing those pipes but a couple of people who asked um, where do you get a thermostat that controls both um, an oil heat and heat pump um, but heat pumps are each both are separate remotes um, so, so there's two separate questions there. If you've got a ducted system, so, so you don't usually have remotes on a ducted system, you've just got zones, um, then, uh, the, uh, then if you put a new heat pump system in, it will come with new thermostats. And those thermostats will control both the existing fossil fuel furnace and the, um, the new heat pumps, and they'll just work together. Um, that's the easiest way to do it. If, you, if you've got a heat pump already, um, and you've got a fossil fuel furnace and they're, and they're not on the same thermostat, I would just uh, call an electrician and get them to put in thermostats designed to run both, both systems. Um, I have thermostats made by Honeywell, uh, and I really like them. They're, they're easy to use. They're, they're accurate. And they do actually, they come with an app for my iPhone, uh, which is great because I, I know it sounds pathetic, but I, I, like, I set the temperature from my iPhone, I can't, I can't even bother to get up and go to the thermostat anymore. It's much easier to do it over my phone. And um, so, and almost all thermostats these days will come with that um, smartphone app, uh, which I find very useful. Uh, if I'm feeling a bit cold, I just turn it up a couple of degrees and then I'm starting to feel a bit warm, I'll turn it down. Whereas I, I never used to walk over to the thermostats and, and, and adjust them. But if I'm sitting here working um, and I'm feeling a bit cold, I just turn it up a couple of degrees and I, I I think it's um, it's much better to have the heat when you feel like you need it 
rather than just setting it on and and running all the time when you are using heat created by your heat pump it's created by electricity which in turn is created by fossil fuels so how does this contribute towards being carbon neutral um, yes, you're absolutely right. So when you use a heat pump to um, to heat your house, you're using electricity, which comes from the grid, of course. And, and that is made by fossil, well, some of that is made by fossil fuel furnaces that has a carbon footprint. However, the carbon footprint from burning heating oil or burning natural gas is far higher than the carbon footprint of using grid electricity to run a heat pump. Because remember that heat pump has two and a half times the heating efficiency of a fossil fuel furnace. So that combination of using grid electricity plus the two and a half times heating efficiency um, gives you a far lower carbon footprint than burning a fossil fuel. So in my case, I was burning heating oil and our carbon footprint dropped by, I think it was 14 tons per year. And that's the net effect of reducing the carbon footprint by no longer burning heating oil and the, um, the increased uh, carbon footprint from using electricity from the grid. Um, now, what we actually did is uh, uh, cut down our electricity use from the grid by having solar panels. And so when you run solar panels and you're running a heat pump, you're heating at two and a half times the efficiency of a fossil fuel furnace. I'm using solar power generated from my roof at about five or six or seven cents per kilowatt hour two and a half times efficiency. So I'm heating my house at less than half the cost of heating with natural gas, which has been the cheapest source of heat in, in housing for, for many, many years. Um, but I'm now heating my house at less than half the cost um, of heating with natural gas because I'm using my cheap solar power to power my efficient heat pump. And that's how I can get down to a um, zero carbon footprint and zero bills at the same time. Makes sense to me. So this is an interesting question for me. <laughs> um, Rose asked, does the fossil fuel heating need to be sized for the whole house coldest weather full heat demand or can you get by with a smaller burner? Meaning on the coldest nights mornings, does the heat pump deliver at, at least a significant fraction of the heat requirement? Yeah, so what you just described is exactly what I have at my house. <laughs> Excuse me. So, so just yesterday, we had a very cold night last night. And so when I woke up this morning, my, my thermostat was set to, let's say, 70 degrees, but the house was at 65. And so what I did, I, and that's it was running only on the heat pumps. And when it's really cold outside, like uh, below about 20 degrees Fahrenheit outside, the heat pumps start to struggle a bit. Um, they can probably keep it there to about 10 degrees Fahrenheit. But below 10 degrees, and I think it was 5 degrees this morning, um, they really can't keep up without a backup fossil fuel furnace. And so I turned on the, um, the electrical breaker that controls the, um, the, uh, the fossil fuel, my, my oil burning furnace. And I, I turned it on for maybe an hour or two. That got the temperature back up very quickly to um, let's say 70 degrees. And then the heat pumps can maintain that temperature all throughout the day because the temperature outside warmed up to about 30 degrees today. I was about 40, 40 by mid afternoon. So at that temperature, the heat pumps are fine. They can easily keep the house warm um, and they'll be fine tonight because it's only gonna get down to about 30 degrees tonight. So, um, so I think that that is actually, the, I, I think is the best solution is to keep that fossil fuel furnace. Otherwise, unless you have superb wall insulation, <coughs> excuse me, superb glazing, um, it's very unlikely that your heat pump will be able to keep your house at 70 degrees you know, all throughout the winter time. So that's why I recommend keep, keep your fossil fuel furnace, at least for a couple of years. If you find you can keep the house warm uh, without using any fossil fuel at all, great. Um, and then maybe you think about taking it out, but I wouldn't take it out right away because you might be left with either very high bills or, um, or a very uncomfortable house. Right, thank you. <clears throat> got a very technical question from John, so I'm going to read it directly as it is. Um, he said they generate they photovoltaic voltaic generate about 9,000 kilowatts per hour per year more electricity than they use at home in northern Vermont. We've started to displace our use of oil by replacing our oil-fired water heater with a hybrid electric hot water heater. Would you recommend an air to hot water heat pump 
to heat existing radiant hot water loops in the house as a best investment to displace most of our oil use, about 500 gallons a year with no real need for AC in the summer. Okay, so the only thing that's gonna be a problem for you there is the radiant heat. If you've got radiant heat now, by radiant, do you mean underfloor heating or do you mean baseboard radiators? I'm not sure if John is still here. John, if you're okay. here, will you go ahead and chat out and chat? Okay, well, let me, let me answer both questions. If you have true underfloor radiant heating, the temperature of that water going around the un, underneath the floorboards is typically 90, 100, maybe 110 degrees Fahrenheit. Yeah, John's saying it's under underfloor heating. Okay, so, so that, uh, that, that is the output temperature of a heat pump. So, so heat pumps connecting directly to underfloor heating is a very good use of a heat pump. Uh, I think you'd be very happy with that. What is a little more tricky is heat pump to hot water baseboard radiators, because the water temperature coming out of a fossil fuel furnace is about 140 degrees Fahrenheit, which is very hot. That's where the term piping hot came from. You can almost burn yourself on a, um, a fossil fuel uh, uh, furnace driven uh, baseboard radiator system. Um, and, and the heat pumps can't get it to 140 degrees Fahrenheit. They get it to about 100, 110, maybe 120, but not 140. And so um, it's, it's harder to replace um, a, uh, a, a fossil fuel furnace driven baseboard radiator um, heating system with a heat pump than it is to replace a, um, to add a heat pump to a, a, an underfloor um, a radiant heating system. The underfloor heating system, I think you'll be very happy with. What I'd recommend with the, uh, uh, if you've got baseboard radiators, is just leave your fossil fuel furnace in place. Because what will happen then with that rate, with that thermostat that, that controls both of them, if the heat pumps can't keep up, it'll just switch on the fossil fuel furnace. And although it won't cut your carbon footprint to zero, it will keep your house nice and warm and avoid you having you know, a, a cold spot in the winter time, which nobody really wants. So to me, asking people to suffer through the winter time um, with cold spots in their house, isn't really a way to encourage people to adopt uh, efficient heating methods. So in my opinion, you should just leave your fossil fuel furnace in place, add the heat pump. You can get heat pumps, aerosol heat pumps that give you hot water to go around baseboard radiators. They're not made by the same companies as like Carrier, Train, Bosch, Mitsubishi. Those are air conditioning companies that have morphed into heat pump companies. If you want to buy a, um, a uh, hot water baseboard radiator system, there are three companies that I know make them. There are probably others, but the three companies are Jaga, J-A-G-A, Space Pack, S-P-A-C-E-P-A-K, and Daikin, D-A-I-K-E-N. And they're different manufacturers to the HVAC guys. Um, the technology is basically the same, but um, the distributors and installers are different. So you need to find one of those um, heat pump suppliers and uh, call them to find a local rep who can install it for you. But, but they do work. Uh, they work very well. But I'd recommend leaving your fossil fuel furnace in place just to make sure you don't get cold spots in the wintertime. Sorry, Mina, I'm just going to jump in and ask Melissa's question here because it seems to be pretty closely related. Um, could you speak a little bit more about how air source heat pumps work with hot water baseboard systems? They're hoping to retrofit their baseboards, but we're told the heat pumps did not get hot enough to do that. Um, so, so there's some truth to that, but, it, but, it, but it's, it should not stop you from doing it. You can have any source of heat and any distribution method for the heat. So the source of heat can be a fossil fuel furnace, oil, natural gas, propane. It can be a heat pump, uh, air source heat pump, or geothermal. That's your source of heat. Then you've got to distribute that heat around the house. You can do it with a baseboard radiators with water circulating around, or you can do it with air going through ductwork. Doesn't matter. You can mix and match any, any source of heat with any distribution system. So if you've got baseboard radiators, you can buy an air source heat pump it does not have to be a geothermal heat pump. Sometimes people think you need a geothermal heat pump to go with a baseboard radiator system. It's not true. Any source of heat with any source of distribution works. It's just the manufacturers are different, as I mentioned. It's Jaeger, Daikin, Space Pack make the air source heat pumps that connect to a baseboard hot water system. But you're absolutely right. The temperature output from the heat pumps is not as high as that of a fossil fuel furnace. And... Um, and so that's why I recommend you leave your fossil fuel furnace in place. I think you um, touched on this earlier, but Bill asks, do heat pumps help alleviate humidity in the summer? 
Um, yes, they do. So when a heat pump is in air conditioning mode, it's dehumidifying the air. Anytime you cool down warm, humid air, you get condensation. And, and that happens with an air conditioner. It happens with, um, with a, a heat pump in air conditioning mode in the summertime too. So you will get dehumidification um, when you're using your heat pumps in the summertime. They will not dehumidify in the wintertime when they're in heating mode, but that's usually not a problem. Usually humidity is not a problem in the, um, in the, in, in the wintertime. Humidity is usually a problem in the summertime when the heat pump is operating in air conditioning mode and it will be dehumidifying the air. Actually, we're interested, what, what are the comments on that? So if you put in a heat pump hot water heater, which we have as well, so we have heat pumps that um, heat the, um, the air for our house, but, but the hot water for the, the baths and taps and sinks um, is also heated by a heat pump. Uh, it's heat pump hot water tanks. Sometimes they're called hybrid hot water tanks. Um, they're very efficient, and particularly when powered by solar electricity, they're very cheap to run. And what a heat pump hot water tank does is it, is it dehumidifies the basement. And this is almost never talked about by the salespeople for heat pump hot water tanks. They talk about the efficiency and all that kind of stuff, but they never talk about the dehumidification. But this is a real benefit to me of having a heat pump hot water tank is it dehumidifies the basement. And all basements get damp. There's always some pipes dripping or you've got some damp coming up from the bottom or humidity condensing on the pipes in the summertime. So uh, a, um, a, a heat pump hot water tank, which is perpetually drying out the basement is, um, is really good. And it's a, a kind of an untalked un, un about benefit of, um, of having, uh, having a heat pump hot water tank. But I highly recommend them, particularly if you've got solar panels as well. Um, Margaret asks, uh, you kind of mentioned the difference between blown in insulation and other kinds. They said when MassSave blew in insulation, some of it came out in the basement and near the baseboard heating units. In two locations, it turns out there was a huge empty space that was almost impossible to fill. Is it common to find that in a house built around 1960? And if so, how would you insulate such a space? Uh, so yes, unfortunately, it is, is quite common. Um, and if you go back, the older the house, um, the more common that is. If you go back to um, uh, our, our rental property was built in 1810. It's in a, a very old New England colonial farmhouse. Um, and back then they did something called balloon construction where the, 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 the trees are much taller and you're able to get long straight planks of wood. So they just got 20 foot planks of wood and they built the sides of the house out of a single plank of wood. So when they put the, the framing up, you have a, it's called balloon framing where there's a, a cavity from the ground floor all the way up to the roof. Now these days, trees just don't grow that big anymore or, or the, not the ones that are cut down. And so, um, so you get, the first floor is built, then it's capped off, and then the second floor is built. But there's there's not a cavity that goes all the way from the bottom to the top. So if you go into older houses, it gets even worse. So I think if you're going to uh, fix that problem, uh, you probably have to go with an insulation con contractor who's not mass save, because what mass save does is the the low hanging fruit, the cheap, easy stuff to do. They they want to get in, get out, and get on to the next job. But if you need some careful work, you're probably going to have to hire a uh, an insulation contractor to do the work because there's, there's going to be more labor time to do it. But insulation is such good value for money. Um, it's almost always worth paying a bit extra beyond what's freely available for mass save and getting someone to do it right. Um, to get the air sealing done right uh, in a complicated house takes more work. And to get the insulation done right, um, particularly to get, get the insulation done right and avoid things like condensation happening, um, it takes more work. But, and it's worth paying a bit extra for that because um, uh, uh, it, it, it's, it's gonna save you so much money on the heating bills. Um, it's, it's worth paying the extra to get the insulation and the air sealing done right, even if mass save won't do it for you. Um, your batteries, are they able to power, how long are they able to power your house for? Uh, so I've designed the system to power us essentially overnight. Um, I think I need about 10 kilowatt hours, I think, of storage to power the house overnight. And I just run the emergency panel. I'm not running, I'm not running the heat pumps. That would take far more electricity. If I'm in emergency mode, I'm running the fans and the oil blower circuit, the oil, the oil burner circuit. But I'm not running the heat pumps. Um, and that's about 10 kilowatt hours of storage is what I need until the next day. Now, the next day, you may remember I was talking earlier, when, when the grid power goes out, you have to disconnect your inverter 
from the grid to avoid electrocuting the linemen coming to fix the lines, uh, but you can, you're allowed to reconnect your solar panels behind the panel, now isolated from the grid, and use the solar panels to either power the house or charge the battery. So I've gone with a 10 kilowatt hour battery. Batteries are priced basically per kilowatt hour of storage, um, because that will get me overnight till the next day when the sun comes up, when I can generate, um, even, on a, even on a cloudy winter day, I can generate at least 10 kilowatt hours per day, and that's enough to recharge the battery during the day. Um, how much lawn space do you need for a geothermal unit and how deep do the pipes need to be buried? This person has lots of ledge around their house. Um, so ledge is actually not an issue because you're going to pay per foot of drilling and they drill through whatever it is. They'll drill through your know, sand, mud, rock, doesn't matter. They don't charge differently for that. It's just so much per foot. I think the cost is about $20 per foot, but uh, I'd have to check with someone to, to be sure. Um, so it's not going to ruin your lawn because the, the pipes are vertical. So all you'll get is like a cap. Um, and then, then that water will be taken through a pipe into the house. But you, you, you will barely be able to see the geothermal system. In fact, some of them I think you don't even see, they just pipe it directly into the house underground. Um, so it's all underground. So you'll have a, a, a big drill rig in the back of the garden to drill the holes. Um, but when it's done, there'll be no impact on your lawn. You'll, they'll just put the topsoil back and, and put grass seed down uh, and it won't look any different. But, but underground, there'll be a big, a big uh, deep pipe. Um, and it's, it's usually the cost of drilling those wells is the, um, is, the, is the biggest cost of putting in the geothermal system. The heat pump itself is exactly the same as the heat pump in an air sourced heat pump. It's just the, the source of the heat is water in a geothermal system versus um, versus air in an air source heat pump. And so would that mean that you don't necessarily need a huge amount of lawn space? Correct. Now, there are some types of um, geothermal systems where imagine you're putting a new house in, and you, you, you ripped up all the back garden. You can actually put a coil of pipes um, underground, maybe six feet underground. Um, and the coil of pipes is long enough. You can flow water through it, extract the heat from it, and, um, and use that to, to power the house. And that may be what you're thinking of. Uh, it is possible to do it that way. Um, it's, I wouldn't advise doing it that way if you've got ledge because you know, you'd have to have a track excavator dig all the way through that ledge or blast all the way through that ledge. It's much easier to drill down vertically and just go through the rock and, and drill down vertically. Um, but if you've got more like um, soft material, um, like uh, glacial till or something like that, then you can um, sort of scoop out the garden and put coils down. Uh, but it doesn't really make sense unless it's new construction because it's, it's an awful lot of uh, you know, digging up your back garden to do that. And you have to have a lot of back garden too to, um, to get enough area for the pipes to go in. So these days, most geothermal systems are put in with, with deep wells, not with um, coiled pipes under, under, the, under the ground. Bill asks, what's the ideal airspace width between panes of glass to get the most R value? Uh, good question. Half an inch is, is the answer. And almost everyone in the industry only makes half inch uh, space glass. It's to do with the physics of, of airflow. Um, and it's, it's the perfect optimum is somewhere between half an inch and three quarters of an inch, but it's totally standardized. You can't buy like a one inch uh, panel, even if you wanted to. It comes with almost universally standard half inch air gaps um, in, in double glazed and in triple glazed. So in triple glazed, you have two half inch air gaps double glazed you have one half inch air gap. So we've got two pretty similarly related questions uh, about roof replacements. If you have solar panels installed, does it make it more costly and how does it work? Um, so my roof, it's a flat roof. Um, it was about uh, 15 years old uh, when I was coming up on the decision to put the solar panels in. So I actually replaced the roof. Um, uh, I replaced the roof before the solar panels went on because it would cost me more to replace the roof afterwards. I'd have to pay someone to take the solar panels off and then reinstall them. That's a lot of labor time. So, um, so I, if, if your roof is coming up on being replaced, I would suggest you replace it now before you put the solar panels in, um, rather than bear that extra cost of removing the solar panels before you have to replace the roof at 20 or 25 years or whatever the lifetime of the roof is. Mm -hmm. 
And we have a, we, <laughs> the uh, attendee has a sunroom which is overhanging. Would we do the same to insulate beneath the sunroom, even though it's outdoors, one would um, a basement ceiling? Uh, if you've got enough crawl space under the sunroom to get underneath it, then I would definitely recommend putting in fiberglass or something underneath it. Uh, it's very cheap, easy to do. You probably do it in half a day yourself if you if you wanted to do it, um, and and that would then keep that um, sunroom much warmer in the winter time. Uh, you, you'll notice the effect immediately when you do this. Um, if you use your sunroom in the winter, now if you're only using your sunroom in the summertime, then what's the point? But it will it will actually keep the room cooler. In the summertime, if you if you need to air condition that sunroom to keep it um, pleasant in the summertime, then having insulation will reduce the AC bill um, because you'll be stopping that heat from coming in from underneath the uh, uh, the, the sunroom. But if you're only going to use it, you know, in the summertime, I'm not sure it's going to be worth it. But if it's a four season uh, uh, porch or sunroom, or you want it to be a four season room, and it's maybe only only warm enough three seasons now, then I would definitely put insulation underneath it. Um, and uh, if you've got standard rafters, they're, they're like 10 inches deep, I'd just buy 12 inch um, uh, fiberglass uh, bats and just shove them up into those, um, in, in between the floorboards there. Very easy to do. You can pay a contractor to do it. I doubt Massey would pay for this. Uh, you can pay a contractor to do it, but it is, really is very easy to do. If you do it yourself, wear a mask because the fibers in fiberglass irritate um, and wear goggles as well because uh, you can get them in your eyes. And it's really painful. Um, um, and wear, wear a long sleeve shirt so you don't get it on your um, on your arms. But but once, once you've done it, it's perfectly safe. It's only when you're actually installing it that it can irritate and you have to take those precautions. But once it's installed, it's completely safe. Mm -hmm. We want to be mindful of the time. We're going to take these last five questions and then call it a night. Um, so Maurizio would like to know, is a $20,000 expense justifiable to increase roof insulation from two to four inches on top of the expenses for a planned roof replacement? So you're going from two inches of some type of insulation to four inches. Is that like an ISO board or something like that? Mauricio, if you're still here, give us a shout on the chat. Uh, I would say, it's, generally speaking, I would say it's not worth $20,000, but I'm surprised it costs $20,000 to add just two inches of ISO board. Um, it's a rigid panel. Okay, so it's something like ISO board. Um, that seems like a very expensive um, addition of, of insulation. If you've got two inches today, it's probably going to be about R8 or R10, so you'd be going to R16 or R20. Um, I, I'm just, I'm just kind, of, kind of ballparking this. I, that just sounds very expensive to me to add that small amount of, of insulation. So I'd, um, I, I'd, 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 I'd call Mass Saving my first place to go, actually, and they're not going to put um, ISO board in for you. They really only do blown in cellulose or fiberglass. But if you have the option of putting in fiberglass there, um, I think it's going to be much cheaper to do that. Um, I, 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 without doing the calculations, I couldn't really be sure, but my gut feel would be for $20,000, uh, I'm not sure it's going to have a good payback for you. Um, insulation is usually much cheaper than that. Um, even, just imagine, you, so it's just to spec out the job for yourself, calculate the number of square feet you need, go to Home Depot or Lowe's, just look at the cost per square foot of ISO board, it's nowhere near. I can't see how you can get to twenty thousand dollars. That's um, and if you if you're comfortable doing it yourself, it's it's not hard. You just nail it into the rafters. Um, uh, yeah, Timish frame we're finishing out it. Okay, well that's, that's a bit more work then. You'd probably have to nail it into or screw it into the the wooden rafters through the existing plasterboard and then put new plasterboard up. But even putting new plasterboard up is pretty inexpensive. Um, and again, it's something you can do yourself. So um, I, I'd get, I'd, I'd call a few more contractors before <laughs> before I'd commit to that one. I don't think you're going to get your money back on twenty thousand dollars. But if it was more like a few thousand dollars, then um, then yeah, I think it probably would be worth it. Okay. Well, Lee has a, a question about installers as well. He has um, referrals for ductless installers, but he has ducts throughout his house. And how does he find somebody to install ducted? heat pumps. He lives in Littleton. Um, 
so I've only used one company as an installer for ducted heat pumps. And that was a company called Rodenheiser, mm -hmm. uh, which is well known around here where, where I live, but I'm not sure they would go as far as Littleton. Um, but uh, I, I would suggest, so, so one thing I would do is download my slides I used tonight because there, there's the questions to ask a heat pump installer are in there. And I would definitely ask those questions of a heat pump installer. But generally speaking, what I found is heat pumps, you don't want to go with Joe the plumber. Right. You need someone who's got some experience and has more like an HVAC company who um, has electricians on staff, has plumbers on staff, who has um, uh, pipe fitters who can do the, the ductwork for you and has a back office, has an administrative staff because there are a lot of subsidies available for um, uh, for heat pumps from your utilities. And I know in Littleton, you've got, an, you've got a, um, a municipal light and power plant, which has a cheaper uh, cost of electricity than where we are with Eversource and National Grid. So your economics is going to be a bit different too. Um, but I would definitely, um, with, with, with cheap electricity, you're probably going to find the economics of heat pumps are actually favorable to you uh, without even doing solar. Um, solar is going to be less favorable to you because your electricity is much cheaper in the first place. Um, but uh, I think that's, um, that's probably the way to go, I would suggest. Um, so Mary had asked the same question about ductless heat pump installation. And is, would Rodenheiser be the same person to contact for solar panel installation? No, 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 no def definitely not for solar panel installation. Let me just, just, just stick on. on, on oh, I'm sorry. Moment. No, that's quite right. Um, so I would not, don't go with Joe the plumber, right? You need someone who's got electricians on staff, uh, plumbers on staff, and an administrative function in the back office to get all the paperwork processed to get you all the discounts and rebates. So I would go with more of a full service uh, contractor, which Rodenheiser is, but if they're not in your area, I would look for someone who's more like a full service contractor. Um, for the solar panels, I have yet to see a company that's capable of doing solar panels and heat pumps at the same time. I wish they existed. I think it'd be, uh, if I was in the business, that's what I'd be doing, uh, because you really need to do it all together with insulation and windows as well, but no one, no one does it all together. So you're gonna to have to get a separate HVAC contractor to do the heat pumps um, and then a separate solar contractor um, to, do, to do the solar panels. Uh, but for solar, for solar panel contractors, again, my slides have that list of questions to ask a solar panel installer. Uh, the most important of which is um, ask them to calculate for you the cost per kilowatt hour of the um, of the electricity electricity generated by those panels over the guaranteed lifetime of the panels. Now, uh, the Energy Sage website www.energysage.org or .com, I'm not sure what it is. Um, uh, they you can put your information in there. They will send that out as a as a, a request for bids to local contractors, and they will all come back, and they will do all the calculations for you in terms of cost per kilowatt hour. Um, kilowatts you need, kilowatt hours produced, all the numbers, net present value, invest, uh, internal rate of return, they'll do all those calculations for you and every installer will be on the same basis. So what you will get is one installer does it this way, another one does it that way. And I've seen this, I've seen this all over the place. Um, heat pump installers do not know how to do discounted cash flow analysis, in my opinion, right now. Okay, I was trained at Harvard Business School, that's kind of my specialty, but I've seen uh, terrible calculations done by heat pump installers, which would you know would get you a losing grade in my finance classes. Um, uh, this is not what they do. This is no. I mean, they're, they're they're plumbers. They're electricians. They, they know how to install stuff. They just don't have the the back office capabilities to do the financial calculations properly. So use Energy Sage because they do them properly, and everyone is done on the same basis. So you get a real comparison, apples to apples comparison. Of different installers. So I'd definitely use Energy Sage to get your solar panel quotes. Thank you. We've got another uh, request for recommendation, this time for water heaters. And is a tankless electric heater better for saving energy? Um, so I, I really recommend getting a heat pump hot water tank uh, for, for all your heating needs, particularly if you can do it with solar panels. Solar panels give you cheap electricity, the heat pump hot water tank uses electricity, but it's using that, um, that high efficiency, the two and a half times efficiency, which actually is the efficiency of, um, of a, a heat pump that's heating your air. A heat pump that's heating your hot water tank 
is not taking your air from not taking its heat from the outside of your house in the middle of winter time it's taking the heat from your basement in the middle of winter time and your basement might be at 50 degrees or 55 degrees much warmer than the outside air say zero degrees so the heat pump heating your hot water is actually much more efficient heat pumps get less efficient as it gets colder outside so if you're taking the heat from the air in the basement at 50 55 degrees fahrenheit the heat pump is more like four times efficient whereas if you're taking the heat from the air outside it's more like two and a half times efficient averaged over the over the full year so um, heat pump hot water tanks are very efficient and very cost effective even if you're um, paying uh, national grid or eversource electricity rates but if you've got solar rates um, which are much cheaper than utility electricity um, then you'll be heating your uh, electricity heating your um, hot water uh, very very cheaply and as I mentioned, you get this additional benefit of dehumidifying the basement, which is a huge benefit. Basements are always getting damp. So, um, so it's really good to have that uh, dehumidification benefit. Uh, many people run dehumidifiers in the basement and um, they are very expensive to run because dehumidifiers are very inefficient um, and uh, they can consume um, uh, one house I was working on that uh, half their, their electricity is being taken by the basement dehumidifier they can be very expensive to run so much better to get that dehumidification as a side benefit of heating up the hot water for your um you know baths taps and showers and things mm -hmm. and our last question from polly is can a heat pump connect to a system with a propane furnace with forced hot water and how do you connect the thermostats um so yes is the answer to all your questions um it doesn't matter what the source of heat is any source of heat whether it's propane natural gas, heating oil, an air source heat pump, or a geothermal heat pump, any source of heat can be paired with any source of distributing that heat around the house, whether it's um, underfloor radiant heating, whether it's uh, baseboard radiators with water circulating around them, or whether it's ductwork and air circulating around it. You can have any source of heat and any source of distribution. Um, and if you do, and, and, and usually, uh, when you when you buy a heat pump system, it will come with new thermostats, the Wi-Fi thermostats that that connect to your your uh, smartphone, and those thermostats are designed to integrate with the fossil fuel furnace and with the heat pumps. And basically, what they do is they um, they use the heat pumps until the heat pumps can't keep up, and then they turn on the fossil fuel furnace. Um, if you have to do this yourself, if you've got um, if you've got already got heat pumps and a fossil fuel furnace, then I'll just call an electrician and have them in install new thermostats for you. Uh, but if you get a new heat pump system, it will come with new Wi-Fi thermostats. Mm -hmm. Okay, wow. Thank you, David. <laughs> this has been a, uh, what is a marathon um, discussion. Oh my gosh. Um, I, I think we answered, you answered like 60 some questions tonight. <laughs> uh, uh, when do we start? Seven o'clock tonight. So we're doing two and a half hours. My record is four hours um, and three hours of questions and answers after um, an hour of, um, of me talking. That's, that's my record. This is not quite the record tonight, but it's a, <laughs> it's a, it's a good one. I like answering people's questions. I find that um, people often have a sense they should be doing something, even, even they have a sense of what they should be doing. Um, but they, they really get hung up on, on some detail and, and they start talking to contractors and they feel like they're being, being given the runaround. Mm -hmm. the, the heat pump guy is saying this and the solar guy is saying that, and the installation guy is saying this, and it, it, just, it just becomes so complicated, they get overwhelmed and give up. Mm -hmm. Which is interesting is where we started this conversation was people, the reason that you do these talks is to help people yep. navigate that. So. Yep. Um, you know we're so appreciative of this and i i feel like um i'm gonna just redo my entire house <laughs> carbon friendly just just so everyone knows um i have written up 300 different questions and answers uh, that i've received on webinars like this um, i can't really do this anymore because um i've got a full-time job now um but um there are 300 different questions people who ask just like the questions you asked tonight and I wrote up the questions and wrote up the answers and you can search it. It's all on my website and just uh, just go there for free and, and read it. Because if you've got a question, it's almost certain somebody else has had a similar question in the past. So you can you can get the answers there. Mm -hmm. That is true. And um, like I said, tomorrow I'll send out a recap with the video link, the how to download the book and the code and all of that. 
and some other resources. Um, and I would like to thank all the libraries that have um, participated in this, <laughs> helped us get the word out. It was so exciting. Yep. Dover, Framingham, where Laura's from, Holliston, Lexington, Medway, Sherburne, Tewksbury. What I'd a like list, to thank eh? What a list. I know, some really uh, rock star libraries in uh, <laughs> Massachusetts. Um, I'd like to thank Green Up Ashland and the Ashland Sustainability Committee for supporting this program, as well as the Friends of the Ashland Library again, who take care of all of our, um, support all of our programs. And Lara, you are like my partner in crime. Thank you so much for <laughs> jumping Thanks in. Thanks for talking. having me. Oh, absolutely. I uh, feel like I want some of those cookies and milk your husband was getting off on the side there. Um, <laughs> But David, yes, please, I'll take some. <laughs> fresh made <laughs> walnut and chocolate chip cookies. My husband was sneaking oh, around in the back eating. <laughs> no, she's always got something interesting going on. But we have so, people I, here. Did I give you my mailing address? I <laughs> <laughs> mail me some cookies. That's okay. At least so we could do it. <laughs> um, I also want to thank everybody who stuck around to the, you know, to the end and um, let you know that David also donated paper his paper book the paper back book to all the libraries that participated in this event and so is that right all of them, uh, most I'm not of them? everyone asked for I, I offered it to everyone yes. but I'm not sure everyone actually took it up took me up on it so so yeah you can go to your library and check out um check out those books I think most libraries actually gave uh, two copies of um zero carbon home and I did write a second book called zero carbon pool mm -hmm. for anyone who's got a swimming pool which are may big consumers of, of um, heat and electricity and I cut the carbon footprint on my pool to zero two and actually made a bigger return on investment um higher return on investment on the pool than on the house so that book is at least in most libraries uh, in this network they have have probably one copy of zero carbon pool and two copies of zero carbon home yes so but, thank you but, for your if you want it but you can download it from my website so um you can download the kindle version or the ipad version and if it doesn't work email me because sometimes it doesn't work sometimes it just gets broken um, just email me and i can just email you the file yeah um i will include your email address in my yeah. recap that'd be tomorrow. great that'd be great and, yeah so Again, thank you so much. We really appreciate your time and everybody's um, thoughtful questions. And we hope that your houses become zero carbon very soon. <laughs> That's great, Mina. Thanks very much. Good night, You're everyone. Welcome. Good night, everybody.